Healthcare for the Homeless Council's pre-conference institute on gender-affirming care. Uh, my name is Kelly Klein. I work at the council, and I will be your host for today. So if you have any questions about logistics, speakers, content, et cetera, um, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll be in that back corner right there. Just some quick housekeeping things before we get started. Um, if you need to use the bathroom, we have some all-gender bathrooms at the end of the hall. Uh, we also have some bathroom spaces. Um, if you go around the huge U of this floor, there's some on the other side as well. Uh, the Wi-Fi information is Marriott Bonvoy Conference, um, and the password is NHCH. So if you have questions or forget what the password is, feel free to ask me about that as well. Um, again, the password is NHCH. I'm super excited to have you all here for today. We'll probably have some folks trickle in uh, as we get the room change figured out. So thank you all for your patience with that. Um, but I think we're going to go ahead and get started just so we make sure we're on time for the rest of the day as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to our first speaker, Britt Walsh, and I'll let you introduce yourself to the group. Good morning, everyone. How's this volume? Okay, great. I was telling Kelly it's been a minute since I've done an in-person presentation. Um, yeah, but it's nice to be with you all. I'm Britt, I use they and he pronouns. I work at an FQHC in Washington, D.C. called Whitman Walker Health. And this morning I'm gonna go through um, just like some ways that we can affirm expansive gender identities. A uh, little bit more about that agenda. I'm gonna share and encourage some personal reflection and kind of set us in some context. Um, we'll go over some keywords, concepts, definitions. I'll talk through maybe some myths that we've all heard about trans people, share some realities or health disparities that trans folks face, and I'll briefly talk about gender affirming care and like a small, small piece of what your roles might be. I know the day is filled with more experts and folks sharing kind of the how-to in that. And I'm also gonna try to remember to do image descriptions. There's a billboard on this slide that had been in Detroit, Michigan, and it says trans people are sacred. So again, I'm Britt. Um, I'm a white, queer, trans, non-binary person. Grew up in Michigan, was raised in an evangelical household. Um, I have ancestry in Northern Europe. Um, I'm also trained as a clinical social worker with an emphasis in community practice. And so in my job as the director of gender affirming care, I'm kind of guiding policies and procedures for staff, for clients, um, trying to kind of elevate our best practices and standards of care. And I also practice as a therapist. Um, and I would love for each of you to be thinking about whether in that framework or a similar or different one, um, sort of who are you, what are the identities and experiences that you're bringing with yourself in this room today, um, and maybe what questions do you have, um, what assumptions have you made um, about yourself, about others, about the topic, um, and just kind of holding that in some context for our time. I also want to frame us in this concept of cultural humility. And I've heard that there might be some clinicians in the room, so I'm gonna take a leap and maybe assume some of you have been in a talk that's about cultural competency. And I kinda wanna distinguish the difference between cultural humility and cultural competency. For me, competency often sounds like a one and done. I checked the box, I did it, I'm good. Maybe next year I'll do it again. Um, and I really appreciate the framework of hum cultural humility. And there's three tenets that I want to highlight for our time and kind of think about how we're all practicing these as individuals and maybe in the organizations we're a part of. The first one is a commitment to lifelong learning and critical self-reflection. So again, in thinking about who are we, what were we taught, what assumptions do we have, how are we here today with openness to learn from one another. Um, also recognizing and challenging power imbalances in order to have respectful partnerships. So this is a unique role for me to be at the front at a podium talking with people. I'm standing, you're sitting. Um, I'm you know, staring at some slides. I feel a little bit my heart racing because there's this implication that I'm an expert. And I really want to do what I can to level that. So I encourage questions, interruptions. Um, I'm only an expert in my own experience and I'm going to share some information that I've gathered. Um, but I recognize each of you and the people we work with are the experts in their own experience. I think that's a piece of this humility too. And lastly, um, what does it mean to practice institutional accountability? So institutional yet also individual, how are we looking to the organizations we're a part of um, to do better than just you know, ask pronouns occasionally or to host um, 
Agenda 101. So we can talk through, uh, towards the end, we'll have some ideas of what else institutional accountability or creation of more inclusive spaces looks like. And the image at the bottom here um, is a photo of two trans women hugging. They're both dressed in formal wear, smiling at the camera that's off to their left. Um, one is a black woman with long highlighted hair. The other is a brown woman with dark black hair. And there are some people in the background also wearing formal wear. So the last part of context I want to offer um, in terms of what does it mean to have this conversation today. The image on the right is just a screenshot of a website called um, anti-trans bills, I think, or antitranslegislation.org. Um, and it says that in 2023, anti-trans bills continue to be introduced across the country. Uh, at the point that this snapshot was taken, there had been 533 bills introduced in 49 states. And at the time, which with the snapshots from two weeks ago, 64 of those bills had passed, um, 97 had failed, and 372 were still active. Um, this might be not quite, but it, yeah, to, this is the first time in a while that I've stood in front of a room of people I don't know and said that I'm trans. And to do that in Maryland, where we just had some protections passed for trans healthcare, feels a certain way. But also, I don't know any of you, so it feels incredibly vulnerable in the context of this. Um, and so I really deeply appreciate that each of you is here, and I just want to put some things out there that feel important for me to name at this point in time that we don't need to understand everything about what it's like to be trans in order to believe that every person deserves health care that is compassionate, age appropriate, and individualized to our personal medical needs. Everyone, including trans people, should be able to visit healthcare providers who support us without interference from power-hungry politicians who don't have our best interests at heart. Um, and I just want to acknowledge also, in case anyone came in with some assumptions or just didn't know, every major US medical and mental health organization, and I won't read them off, supports access to gender-affirming support and care for transgender young people and adults. So that's some context that I'm coming in with and wanted to place us all in today. Next, we're going to go through some concepts, definitions, ideas. Please, again, stop me if you have questions or comments. I'd love for every one of you, if you haven't before, but maybe especially in this morning while we're all together, um, to think about what were you taught about gender? And in particularly, when did you know your gender? And I ask that as a trans person who gets asked that almost every time I engage in healthcare of some kind. Well, when did you know you were trans? And I don't know your identities in the room. Maybe some of you are gender expansive or transgender. But if you're not, I'm curious if you've ever thought about your gender in that way and how you knew it. Um, and I've got an image on the screen here. There's like two panels. It's a blue rubber duck and a pink rubber duck. And I'm going to read the little post-it notes that are around them. And I'd love, again, for you to consider sort of who are you what experiences have you had that brought you in the room that informed what you know about yourself and how you move through the world? And some of the things that I think I've heard and people have informed these little post-it notes as I've given this talk are things like, well, boys don't cry. Women and girls work in the home and do caretaking. Girls are timid and deferential. With that long hair, someone will think you're a girl. Men and boys are physically stronger and bigger. Only boys excel in math and science. So yeah, wherever you're at in today, throughout the talk with these great speakers and your time in the conference this week, I'd love for you to really be investigating, if you haven't before, what were your own ideas about gender, about yourself, um, before you came in this room. Now we're going to get into more of like definitions. And these are words that are defined by myself and some colleagues. So I'm going to read through them somewhat quickly. You can also see them on the screen. But just to kind of clarify, I want to differentiate. This first slide will talk about sex. And the next slide will talk about gender. So here I have that sex is a multi-dimensional construct based on like a cluster of anatomical and physiological traits. That's a bit of a mouthful, the longest definition of sex I'd ever read before. Um, and that I'm referring to as sex traits. So sex traits include external genitalia, secondary sex characteristics, maybe chest tissue, facial hair, gonads, chromosomes, and hormones, things that we don't generally know about ourselves, um, what our exact chromosomal makeup might be, what our exact hormone levels are, um, and so that's why there's some other characteristics of sex that we're usually talking about when we talk about sex. And that first main one here is that it's usually defined at birth. 
as female or male, and that's based on a visual glance at some baby's infant's genitals, and that's usually done by a healthcare provider. And I say that as like a person who was raised in Michigan, Western culture, um, that's the experience that I had. And we assume, again, some normalizing that this is like a Western idea a lot of the time, is that sex traits are assumed to be unambiguous, meaning they're assumed to be very clear. You're one or the other. We either expect that you're going to develop breast tissue or you're not. You're going to have external genitals that look this way or you're not. Um, and that's actually not the case because we know that about folks who have intersex traits and we know that about people who have differences of sex development. And those are both underlying because those are like studied and defined experiences. So we already know that there are people um, who don't develop sex traits in a way that we've normalized or expected. Um, we also know that some sex traits can change or be altered over time. And yet there's all of these things kind of going into what we're talking about when we talk about sex. But again, in my experience, we're most often talking about what were you assigned at birth? Um, and there's so much power and assumption in that little moment right after a baby is born and a medical provider slaps a letter, M or F, on a birth certificate that can like stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, there's only a handful of states that even allow for intersex to be on someone's birth certificate. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about sex, which is very different from what I'm talking about when I talk about gender. Um, again, in thinking about where did you learn about gender, how did you know your gender, this slide today might feel a little heady and also, again, very different than how you've thought about gender before. And I'm trying to really kind of open it up and how I think moving through the world uh, in the United States, there's a lot of pieces that inform someone's gender. Um, again, multi-dimensional, lots of things going into what we're talking about when we talk about gender. It's linking someone's gender identity so that core element that only each one of us knows about our personal sense of self. I don't know any of your gender identities by looking at you, and you don't know mine except that I shared some of it when I introduced myself, but that's what I'm talking about when I talk about gender identity, which is different from gender expression, which is maybe how an individual would outwardly signal their gender to others through behavior or appearance. I'm talking a lot with my hands right now. Maybe in some cultures that's a gendered thing. I'm wearing short hair. Some people, I see some other short-haired folks, so that maybe is becoming less of a gendered thing, but those are some ways that we express our gender. And it also has to do with social and cultural expectations. So that means like social status around gender, characteristics or behavior that are associated with sex traits. Um, again, like what it means to have chest tissue or facial hair. There's lots of also assumptions and norms that are built into folks' genders. Um, to go over, again, characteristics that you might be familiar with, um, in a Western culture, gender is binary, meaning just one or the other. You're a man or a woman, and I'm going to go through a slide next that just visualizes maybe how we've thought about that or been, I've been raised with that. Um, but it can include categories outside of this binary, um, and I think we're talking more about that as a society now. Um, it's often assumed to be determined based on the sex you were assigned at birth. So most infants are assumed to be cisgender, right? Oh, you were assigned female at birth, you're gonna be a woman. And that's just like an incredibly deep, I think deep-seated assumption. Um, but it can be different. And we often talk about gender interchangeably with sex, right? So I know sometimes people are like working on intake forms or even saying like, what was your assigned gender at birth? And yet we're still talking about there's an assigned sex at birth and then there's a personal gender experience. And yet those words I think get interchanged often. Um, conceptually, conceptually distinct things. Um, and lastly, that it can be sort of fluid. It can be contextually fluid, temporally fluid. It can change. Um, so I just want to leave that up there. There's a lot of words on that slide. I spoke quickly. But that's the combination of things that I'm talking about when I talk about gender. And in summary, uh, up at the top here, you've got a blue stick figure person, like legs straight down, maybe wearing pants. A pink stick figure person appears to be wearing a, a dress. Um, and I was taught that gender is like this image at the top. You're one or the other. Like all of the signing, um, bathrooms, all of anything that I needed, it presented options as one or the other. Um, and as I've moved through my life and talked with people and heard other trans folks' experiences and investigated my own, 
um, and just paid more attention, I've realized that there were so many norms and assumptions that went into pink or blue. Like there were no, you know, there was assumptions about the set of categories and the behaviors that I would ascribe to as a person assigned female at birth, when really there was so much more opportunity for gender to look a lot of different ways. At the bottom of the screen here, there's maybe like 20 bodies and they're mismatched in colors. In an ideal world, they'd all be like moving around. Um, yeah, and we wouldn't, you know, some it looks like there's still skirts and pants, so maybe there'd be a mix of things. Um, but that's the other kind of framework in the piece that I would want for us to sit with. If you came in believing that gender was one or the other, and you lost me on that last slide because there were so many words, this is essentially what I would love for us to hold, is that gender is way bigger and more expansive than perhaps I was taught, or maybe that is an experience you had as well. So I'm gonna share next some of the ways that people might identify their gender. We'll go through some definitions. Transgender refers to a person whose current gender identity, that deeply personal sense of self, is different from the sex they were assigned at birth. Someone might also describe a transgender experience, and that can be people who can be classified as transgender regardless of whether they identify as transgender. And I don't know each of your connections and communities, but I know that there are people who are like, well, feeling really nervous to assign themselves or like give themselves that identity as trans, but their experience and how they move through the world is of a transgender experience. So I include that here. That feels really common in some of the communities I work with in DC. There's also, right, specifically transgender identity. So people who do, they hold that identity for themselves and say, I am transgender. We've got cisgender, which refers to a person whose ge current gender identity does correspond to the sex they were assigned at birth. And we have non-binary, which is an umbrella term for gender identities that lie outside of a gender binary. So a person can be transgender and non-binary. As I said myself, that's, that's how I identify. And some ways that you might hear a person talk about non-binary identities are to say gender queer. So maybe that person doesn't follow gender norms. I've heard gender fluid. Um, there's so many. Um, this other one here is agender, so all one word, uh, maybe written similar to how you might see asexual, and that's for a person who does not identify with a gender. Um, and there's so many more words and definitions and opportunities to identify ourselves. Um, so this list is not comprehensive. I think it would be one of those things where it was like updated every three minutes if we were really trying to um, have something in real time. I also want to describe two-spirit here, and this is a placeholder term for specific gender and sexual orientation identities that are centered in indigenous tribal worldviews, practices, and knowledges. That can also be written as 2S, um, and I just want to be really specific in this, that from every, I'm not an indigenous person and everything I'm taught is this is a unique experience only for people who are indigenous, um, that that's not something that I, as a white person with like colonizer ancestry, can claim. Um, and so there's probably so much more to it, and that's why this is just a placeholder. But um, yeah, two-spirit is a gender identity. It can also be a sexual orientation. And this is just a snapshot at some of the key ways that people might describe their gender identities. Next, I'm gonna cover, and I won't read through all of them, but share some names or ways that people describe their sexual orientation, which as we all know is different from gender identity, and yet the ways that we relate to one another, again here, a multi-dimensional construct, so there's lots of ways, things we're talking about when we're talking about orientation. We're talking about emotional connection, romantic, sexual attraction, also our own identity and the behaviors that we have. Um, so identity, a person's sense of self, their sense of sexuality um, can be different from their attraction. So noticing the genders of people you're attracted to. How strong is that attraction? Um, do you feel attraction at all? If you, again, if you've ever thought about how did you know um, your own sexual orientation, what was going on for you in that, think about maybe lots of the different points that led you to those conclusions or understandings of yourself. So maybe it was just about who you were attracted to. Um, maybe it was about behavior that as you became a sexual person, you noticed that there um, 
were just different ways that you engaged with people. Um, so I want to acknowledge again that these three pieces, identity, attraction, and behavior, all inform sexual orientation. And there are some characteristics of that. We know that sexual orientation is often defined based on the gender of the person um, and the genders of the desired partners. Um, but that's not the same as gender identity. So I am sometimes hesitant to talk about sexual orientation because I think it can be confusing. We're here to talk about gender. Why are you telling me about sexuality? Um, and I like to be really clear that a transgender person can have any sexual orientation, including straight or heterosexual. So simply because someone's gender identity is not aligned with the sex they were assigned at birth, that doesn't mean they're automatically gay or lesbian or queer, um, that a person can be straight heterosexual and transgender. Okay, so I already said this, right? Attraction, identity, and behavior, um, all are dimensions of sexuality, and that may not correspond to orientation. So people, you know, I think we're really critical of a celebrity um, named Elliot Page, who's a trans mask person who came out in the last year and a half and was still using language around being a lesbian for some time. And people are like, but wait, he uses he and they pronouns now. He said he's a trans man. How can he still hold this language as a lesbian? And that has to do with the other pieces maybe of attraction and identity and behavior. Um, so we, I think the underlying concept here is we're not making assumptions, we're letting people tell us who they are. Okay, I'll just read through some of these. We've got straight, heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, pansexual, questioning, um, and two-spirit. And then this one that feels, again, particularly relevant in communities where I am in DC is, I'll read, same gender loving refers to non-heterosexual sexual orientation identity that's almost exclusively, in my experience, used by African American and black communities as kind of being resistant to some of the Euro centric language around sexuality. Um, I don't know what the communities that you're working in, maybe you've heard this one before. The other ones probably you've seen around. All right, you don't have to know all the definitions of those words. Phew, I probably couldn't even read or go over those without needing to look at my slides. This one I think will be a little easier and there's a hopefully helpful image on the screen of someone throwing something away in a trash can. These are words that I consider outdated, maybe words we'd want to avoid. Um, again, with the exception that maybe you're working with someone who tells you these are words they use for themselves or a person is describing their experience in this way. I think that's very different than those of us in care provider roles. Um, we, this is not how I would recommend people talk about trans folks or community. Um, so the language of being transsexual or transvestite, that's outdated, um, referring to the transgenders or transgendered people or calling someone a trans or a transgender. It's an adjective, so you could refer to someone as a transgender person. Um, describing gender identity disorder, that's also outdated. Talking about a sex change or the surgery or gender reassignment. Um, referring to people as biologically male or female or born a man or born a woman, that's also outdated. Um, talking about someone being female bodied or male bodied, I think I've even heard talking about female sex organs or male sex organs. Um, that's again just like in, implying gender or sex in body parts. Um, asking someone, what's your real name? What gender were you born as? Um, I wouldn't do that. Or ask, what's your preferred name or pronoun? Um, I think there, on the next slide we'll cover maybe some ways to get around that. And then I just put a little caution out there for any of us in terms of gendered language. What I mean by that is words that have kind of a coded gender experience to them. So if I approach this group and I said, good morning, ladies. And my thought is that that's probably not language that all of you feel seen or affirmed by. Um, and I think that happens a lot in different industries um, and just different ways of being. Sir and ma'am are two examples of gendered words. Um, and I think that one can always be a hot topic. If you have clients that you know feel seen and affirmed and like respected by being sir and ma'am or Mr. or Mrs., then by all means, I think, continue to use that language for them. It can be generational, it can be cultural, um, but when you don't know or you're, you're the, yeah, I wouldn't automatically assume someone wants to be served or mammed. There's lots of gendered language out there, um, even from saying like a, a policeman, a postman, um, that we can try to be more neutral, a police officer, a postal worker, um, not even saying like, hey, you guys, hey, friends, 
maybe just not assuming or putting a gender on a group of people can be helpful. So some words that maybe we already talked about that would feel better, referring to a transgender person as a person, a transgender person and not the transgenders or the trans. Um, if you're working in a clinical context and it's relevant to talk about a diagnosis or even someone's experience, that language is gender dysphoria. That's a, a diagnosis code usually. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about ways around that if, you, if that's not someone's experience. Um, someone might be pursuing gender affirmation, not the surgery or gender reassignment. They might be seeking gender affirming care. Um, someone may experience a gender transition and um, maybe any of you work in medical records or review notes, you might see language from the past of like FTM, MTF. That was really common in medical noting to say like, well, female to male or male to female. But that kind of implies one direction. Um, you're getting to this space. Um, and so that's where we say like, be wary of non-binary identities or just the idea that everyone's trying to get to the other gender. Um, folks' experiences can be very fluid um, and no two trans folks have the same transition. Um, also being upfront of like, my name is Brit. Um, what can I call you? What name should I use for you? Uh, my pronouns are they and he. What pronouns should I use for you? Um, instead of naming like preferred pronouns. I think that used to be, you know, maybe five years ago, it was like, that's the thing to do. Ask everyone their preferred name and pronouns. And language evolves, right? Like we know more. We know that people feel like that downplays the importance of pronouns when we call them preferred. So kind of just being direct, what pronouns do you use? All right. Next, I want to talk a little bit about maybe some myths. I want to do some myth busting and highlight again, just like some realities or disparities around trans healthcare. Um, the first one has to do with this idea of like transness being new. And I just want to name trans people have always existed. And maybe that's not something that you heard about in your upbringing. I certainly had it. Um, and I appreciate doing this work of gathering history and recognizing that like ancient Greek, Roman, South Asian, indigenous, African, and many more cultures have celebrated in, and embraced gender diversity like thousands of years ago. Um, and there's a lot of history that's gone into and research that's gone into exploring that. And this next part says there are infinite ways to experience gender, including not at all. Which I just want to sit with that again. If like gender is something and the language around it is something we created and like gave meaning to around, you know, personal identity, some norms, um, it makes sense that there are people that didn't have that language that had different experiences outside of what some people, you know, a thousand years ago or 400 years ago kind of concocted and came up with to sort of maneuver how we relate to one another um, and what served them at the time. And this image here says trans people exist because our ancestors existed. Um, and I wanna name that again that I hear a lot if we get requests for you know, quotes or like, but what about how are there so many more trans people now? How is it possible? And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think people maybe have language or they feel safer despite that context. Maybe they see that there's a health center in their area that's providing gender affirming care. Maybe they have a friend that they know um, felt really affirmed and was able to start hormones and they're willing to try or they don't feel so alone because they see more trans people out there and around. Um, it doesn't in any way, shape or form feel sudden to me. Um, I'm a little biased, certainly, um, but I wanna talk more about some of those myths and try to help kind of uncover and sift through where is that sense of newness coming from? Where is their fear? So the first myth here is that being trans is a mental illness. And I'm gonna make like an annoying ah sound because it's, I just like really wanna be clear that's not true. I'm gonna do that, there's five of them. Um, being trans is not a mental health disorder. There is nothing inherent to being trans or a trans experience that makes a person more likely to experience um, poor mental health. However, um, trans people are some of the most like systemically and socially medically marginalized people and groups around the world. And we know that there's intersecting identities that play into that. And so the impact of these oppressive systems on trans folks and the harm that is faced can mean, and we, we do see in research that trans folks are likely to have higher rates of depression or suicidality. 
but being trans in and of itself is not a mental illness. Yes, there is a diagnosis code for it, and that's in order for us to access medical care that we need, but it is not a mental illness. The second myth is that all trans people hate their bodies. Eh, not true. All trans people do not hate their bodies. For some trans people, there is discomfort in their bodies, um, and maybe it's like insurmountable. It creates high anxiety, deep depression, um, can't look in a mirror. That's a deeply personal and unique experience to each trans person. But not all trans people hate their bodies, and they may not use the same language to describe how they relate to their bodies or their body parts. So I want to be really clear in that. Um, not all trans people will, will pursue a medical transition like hormones or surgery to change any part of themselves. The third myth is that children are too young to know their gender. Ah, again, um, according to the American Pediatric Academy, excuse me, American Academy of Pediatrics, by age four, most children have a stable sense of their gender identity. And there's lots of research to back that. Um, and I think, again, like we talked about in earlier slides, like we don't question when cisgender children tell us their gender, why do we question and investigate and fear when a young person tells us um, that their gender is not in alignment with the sex they were assigned at birth. Myth four, regret and detransition are common. Eh, totally not common. Um, in fact, very few trans people regret gender-affirming hormones or surgery. There's a one longitudinal study um, that determined um, a regret rate for hormones or surgery of less than 0.5% less than 0.5%. And along with that very, very low rate of regret or detransition, we know through lots of other studies that access to gender-affirming care improves mental health and quality of life for trans people. Um, something I put in just because it was helpful for me to contextualize it, part of my work is talking with folks that need surgery um, because People need a letter of support from at least one mental health provider to access the care that they need if it's surgical. And for comparison, people have a higher regret of knee surgery, which a variety of studies capture that regret rate from anything from 6 to 30% regret rate for knee surgery. Um, and so that's a much higher rate than they do for accessing gender-affirming care. Last I checked, I've never needed knee surgery. Um, I wouldn't have to talk to a mental health provider to get knee surgery. Um, but you do, you often have to have at least one session with a mental health provider to talk about those deeply personal parts, your relationship with your body, um, instead of just like, well, I need to be able to walk every day, so I should probably have this knee surgery, which has a very complicated and timely recovery. Um, so that's just some, some context there. And the myth number five I want to share is that trans people using facilities, so bathrooms or locker rooms, of their gender identity or of their choosing is dangerous. Uh, that's also very wrong. Um, there is no evidence to suggest that allowing individuals access the facilities in alignment with their gender identity or their choosing um, is it, like it increases incidence of violence. There's no studies out there that show that. And when we talk about it in that way, it actually ostracizes trans people um, and credits this misperception that we're dangerous or a threat. Worse, it takes a focus away from the things that we could be doing to increase personal safety. Um, so I just want to put that out there. The New York City had a campaign a few years ago um, when they made it legal for folks to use a bathroom that aligns with their gender um, and had a lot of really cool images about how untrue this myth is. I won't scream at you and make that sound anymore. Um, but I do want to talk through maybe things that you've heard. Uh, so this image on the left, it says, we all deserve respect. You can't tell someone's gender identity by looking at them. You can be supportive of non-binary and gender expansive people always. And the bullets just kind of maybe putting out some more normal things. Someone may feel discomfort or anxiety with personal body parts, language, or experiences that are gender coded. Um, so right. like. I'm saying chest tissue instead of breasts. That's an example of where someone may be like, I don't identify and I feel actually deeply uncomfortable with the idea that I have breasts. I'm just going to talk about it as chest tissue. So someone may feel discomfort in that in terms of how they're informing, what's informing their experience. Um, trans people may also experience discomfort that is about other people's perceptions and I call that social dysphoria. It's not from their own sense of self. I hear that so often when I'm talking with people about their letters um, of like, 
I feel really great when I'm in a room with other trans people. I feel seen, I don't worry about how I'm being read, um, but there's this idea of social dysphoria of like, I don't know how non-trans people or a room of strangers read me, and then I feel really hyper aware of myself. Um, also, just uplifting that someone may explore different genders for alignment. Um, does this feel good? Does this language work? Do I feel euphoria? Am I more comfortable in my body? Am I more comfortable in social situations when I know this about my experience? And that exploration alone can mean many things. And not all people who explore their gender are trans. Um, so I used to say when I asked folks to think about how did you know your gender, that thinking about how you know your gender and thinking about how are you sure you know your gender doesn't make you trans. And some people have shared that it feels really scary to investigate gender if you've never done it before. So I just want to uplift that. It doesn't mean you're trans if you think about your gender very specifically in the next couple of days. Okay. Um, I do want to share some realities now that we've busted some myths. Um, this is a little bit outdated data, but it's what we have right now. It's from the 2015 U.S. Transgender Health Survey. Um, it was conducted by the National Center for Trans Equality. There were about 28,000 respondents who participated online, um, and it looked at sort of education, employment, family life, health, housing, and criminal justice experiences of trans folks. Um, USTransSurvey.org is the website. They just concluded an updated survey. It ended in December of 2022. The data has not yet been analyzed and finalized yet, but it will be like a seven year later look at the experiences of trans people. So keep an eye out for that new data. Um, and I'm just gonna highlight maybe some of the pieces that stand out to me in that. Of that 2015 survey around severe economic hardship and instability, one third of the respondents reported living in poverty or having an employment rate uh, that was 15%, which was three times the national average at the time, and 30% reported experiencing homelessness. With regards to harassment and violence, 46% of people who completed the survey reported um, an experience of verbal harassment in the last year. One in 10 of them had been physically attacked, not attached, attacked, and 47% had been sexually assaulted in their lifetime. With regards to health insurance and healthcare, there are so many statistics about this, I'll just share this one, that 33% of those who'd seen a medical provider in the year prior to the survey um, had at least one negative experience. And if you go into the report, you can read the range of those experiences is from like literally being denied a flu shot or insulin to educating a provider about what it means to being trans, to being physically or sexually assaulted in the medical practice. Um, with regards to psychological distress and suicidality in the survey, 40% of people who responded reported that they'd attempted suicide in their lifetime, and 7% had attempted in the year prior. And with regards to HIV, we know that transgender people are five times more likely to be living with HIV compared to cis people. And in Washington, D.C., where I work, there's an estimated 25% HIV prevalence among all trans people. So those are maybe some more like sombering experiences to ground us. Again, let's look at that map, the legislation that's out there that's anti-trans, the realities that some trans people face depending. Again, let's, this isn't even talking about like intersecting identities and other systemic oppression. Um, and I reiterate that I think now, again, is the time that we're all thinking about how we're providing gender affirming care and inclusive care. I'll go through these next slides somewhat quickly. I think I'm, uh, going to leave time for questions. So um, beyond, again, where each of you are in your role, I'm assuming mostly clinicians, um, but I'd love for us to be thinking again about pronouns. That's something that can happen in any group setting with your colleagues. Also not forcing someone to share their pronouns. Um, correcting people who misgender or misname other people, like in the moment. I attended like a Zoom CEU a week or two ago for my licensure, and I was misgendered several times, and I super appreciated the strangers that I didn't know, like corrected the speaker in the chat about my pronouns, um, and the speaker said thank you. So this next one is like, thank someone who corrects you and also apologize. Um, an example I like to give that can make me deeply uncomfortable, if that speaker had come back on mic and been like, Brit, oh my gosh, I used the wrong pronouns, I feel horrible, I'm so sorry, are you even gonna make it through the rest of the training? Like, I'm blushing just thinking about that, I would have left, that would have felt horrible. But instead, she was like, thank you for correcting me, I'm sorry I misgendered you, and kept going. And that felt so much more appropriate to being in the space and being able to continue, that there was acknowledgement and apology 
And like when people correct us on something or give us feedback, it's like a gift, right? Like they're letting us know how, what they need from us to stay in connection with us. So that's why I say, thank someone who corrects you. Thank you for correcting me on your pronouns. I'm sorry I misgendered you. I will do better next time. Um, that each of us aren't asking trans people questions because we're curious, right? That we are getting, we're lifelong learners, right? We are committed to finding reputable information on our own and talking about it with colleagues. That we're advocating for policies and practices that are inclusive for clients, patients, or staff. That we're avoiding assumptions and being accountable. And I think those, again, are like big picture things that each of us moving through the world can do regardless of whether we're clinicians or direct care providers. If you're an administrator and you're in a position where you can create an inclusive environment, or even if you have a space that's your own that you can try to, with your team, build some inclusivity, um, thinking about what does cultural humility training look like in your workplace? Who has access to it? How routinely are you engaging in these conversations? Maybe not even just training, but is there a case consult? Are we talking about what we could have done better? Um, are we focused on care, right? So not the things we don't have to know about trans people. Are we you know, indulging in questions out of curiosity or are we focused on care? Um, that we aren't disclosing a person's trans identity just because. Like, is it relevant? Does someone have to know? Probably not, but it can actually be a huge safety risk for trans people that you're working with. If you are just kind of just like excitedly or maybe nervously naming that, oh, I have a trans patient in the room right now. Um, I went to get a laser, a tattoo removed at a laser hair, uh, at a provider that had a laser. He heard what I did for work and he's like, oh, the office is full of trans people right now. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I don't need to know that. Like, yes, it sounds great that you feel affirming, but like that, I don't need to know that everyone here is trans. Um, and so think through the opportunities in your workplaces or the practices or what you're doing of kind of what are these touch points and are they affirming and inclusive? And that's like your registration or intake forms, your restrooms, there's an image here that has all gender restroom, it's like a triangle with a circle, there's no bodies. It just says all gender restroom and there's braille beneath it. Um, are your educational materials like inclusive of expansive gender identities? Is it very binary in like language? Is it men and women, men's health, women's health? Um, do you have channels of feedback that are open and that there's like a loop so people can see how you're accountable or following up on those feedbacks? So a big picture again, I think those are pieces that each of us can contribute to um, in terms of the environments we're in. And I will speak very briefly about what I'm talking about with regards to gender affirmation, because I think the slew of speakers today are gonna give you more insight into what that is. But sometimes I'm talking with people who are like, well, I don't know the part I play in gender affirming care or affirming someone's gender. And I recognize that that can be different depending on your training or your role where you work or your position in community. Maybe you don't know that you've got a young person who sees you as a safe space and like might share something with you or your child. Like the, I think there are so many ways that you could end up being supportive or able to be affirming. Um, and so I just wanna kind of clarify that there are lots of different ways that trans folks might seek out or purposely seek out affirmation. One of them is socially. So a person may be trying on different gender expressions, different name or pronouns. If you notice someone saying, oh, I'm using these pronouns now, you know, thanks for sharing, um, I will use those pronouns for you. Or if they say, you hear a colleague referring to someone by a different name, oh, maybe making a mental note, I've got a colleague who's going by a different name, I wanna be affirming and use that name. Um, someone might come out to friends, family, or work. So also just thinking about your role, if you're a mental health provider, your client's sharing that they're exploring something, they might want support, coming out to someone in their life, that those pieces are a part of a social gender affirmation. Um, there are also physical and medical components to gender affirmation that not everybody will pursue. Um, and GAHT is the acronym I'm using for gender affirming hormone therapy. So someone may start hormones. They may pursue gender affirming surgery. Um, they might do hair removal or hair transplant. They might seek voice therapy or speech therapy. And those are kind of all on their line. They're seen a little more formalized. Usually they're seeking out like a health professional for those kinds of supports. But there's also opportunities to do binding, tucking, packing, or use prosthetics. Um, those typically aren't covered by insurance. Maybe some flex spending accounts or health savings accounts will reimburse someone for those items. So if you're in a caseworker role and your client's like, this binder's $50, 
I don't know how to get it covered. Do they have an insurance that, that has flex spending account or an employment-based um, program? There's also sometimes free resources. People do Brinder giveaways. Someone might also pursue legal gender affirmation, changing their name or gender marker in a variety of places. So I wrote here birth certificate, passport, driver's license or ID card, or just like their records broadly. Um, and I, for anyone in this room who's ever had to change your name, maybe you've been married or divorced or liked a different name or saw yourself as somebody with this name, um, I have not legally changed my name, and I hear it's very complicated. And so I'm already like, wow, I'm licensed in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. I'd have to go back and like change all those licenses, and I'd have to change it in all of these places. So not every trans person is going to change their name or gender marker in all of those places or necessarily any of those places. But depending on your role and how you're working with someone, I think it's helpful to keep in mind that some people may, and you might be asked to be a resource or help someone investigate how they accomplish this goal for themselves. If you are a clinician or working in a provider way, I just wanna name some of the standards of care guidelines or resources that I think are helpful to know. I think maybe they could be shared later on. I've got WPATH up here. That's the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Um, this guide was just updated in September, so they have an eighth standard of care out. The seventh was published in 2012, so it took about 10 years to make that update. So there's a lot of criticisms and a lot of excitement about WPATH standards of care. I include it because in my experience it informs most insurance or payer guidelines for surgical coverage in particular. Um, I'll see it referenced in a lot of insurance plans as that's what folks are going off of. Um, I also wanted to include TransLine um, and get a little shout out for that. It is a free medical consult service. They also have a behavioral health consult, but it's staffed by um, very experienced medical providers who are mostly part of FQHCs all over the country, and mostly these FQHCs like Whitman Walker that have a history in LGBTQ care. Um, so you go in, it's like a little Zendesk portal, you submit a question, no personal patient information, Maybe this patient has this history, they came to me on this dosage of a medication, can I continue that? I've never prescribed hormones before. And you'll get consultation, typically I think a response within 48 hours. Um, and you can ask behavioral health questions, I'm one of the providers that staff the behavioral health consult line. TransLine has also put out their own hormone guidelines, which I think is important because they're a group of providers doing what tends to be more progressive work. Um, so the Endocrine Society has some really great guidelines out there also that people look to for a long time. So does the University of California at San Francisco's Transgender or Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. They put some guidelines out there and standards of care around surgery, lots of information. Um, but TransLine also incorporates these kinds of newer or less talked about, maybe somewhat taboo, guidelines from a provider named William Powers. Um, and I include him up there because I think it's helpful to know if you're a medical provider and a patient comes to you and says, do you do the Powers method? Um, this guy is based in Michigan. I don't know him from being from Michigan. Um, he has a lot of YouTube content out there where he loves to talk about the research that he's done. Um, the providers I work with, like roll their eyes slightly because none of it's you know peer reviewed or anything but it works and so the science behind it um, I think is really convincing and so people trans people watch him on YouTube they hear about it and they come and say can I do progesterone can I do this can I have topical tea um, and they ask for things and I think if you're in a medical provider role it's helpful to be aware that there are some providers out there taking it a step further than like the endocrine society guidelines um, which are just guidelines right like I am reminded of that that they're a tool and they don't have to be firmly followed um, the last three on here trans training institute gender health training institute or the national soji center I should say trans training and gender health training are both hubs and kind of consultation and um, training services that are run by trans people for businesses or educational materials. And then the National Soji Center I just heard of, and that's Sexual Orientation, Gender, Identity, and Expression. I think it's based out of the University of Connecticut School of Social Work. But I was really impressed that it was such a robust website around how we talk about sexual orientation, gender identity, have some free resources. So I include them there um, if you're learning, wants to extend beyond today and you're looking for places to start. 
Um, I'm trying to see where to end because I have more slides than I thought. I'll just end here. Something that I like to do is sort of demystify, I guess, um, criteria. I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about being a clinician knowing I have to add a diagnosis in my patient's chart if we're billing to insurance. And I think sometimes people are like, well, I don't feel equipped to document or diagnose this gender dysphoria. Um, and I just want to name what the gender dysphoria diagnosis criteria are from the DSM. Uh, it says, a marked incongruence between one's expressed or experienced gender and assigned gender of at least six months of duration. So I'll pause there. OK, you meet a client. They tell you, for the last year, I've been figuring this out. I've had this discomfort, or this has been my experience. OK, um, and that includes two or more of some of the things from the list below. Um, and it also talks about clinically significant distress, which I think each one of us as clinicians are always sort of figuring out what does that mean, clinically significant distress. If a person's coming to talk to you for support, it sounds like it's probably been pretty significant that they did all the work to get in and meet with you and ask for help. Um, so some of those criteria are, again, just like marked incongruence um, around sex char characteristics, a strong desire to be rid of one's primary or secondary sex characteristics. So facial hair, body hair, chest tissue, genitals. Um, a strong desire for the sex characteristics of the other or an alternative gender. Uh, a strong desire to be the other gender. A strong desire to be treated as the other or alternative gender. And a strong conviction that one has the typical feelings and reactions of the other gender. Um, I recognize, again, like I work exclusively with trans people. So I read this and I was like, this feels so clear to me. And maybe you don't work exclusively with trans people, and maybe it still raises a lot of concerns. I think someone else later in the day is talking through mental health supports um, and surgery support specifically. But I wanted to put it out there because I felt that it was important, like being able to confirm that your client has gender dysphoria, seeing that, to me at least, this doesn't sound so horribly terrifying and uh, impossible to recognize if someone's telling you about their experience. Um, and so just kind of normalizing, again, each of us in our role, like what role do we play to create a pathway or to support someone in getting what they need? Uh, I hear a lot of people who are like, I brought this up with my primary care provider or my therapist, and they were like, I don't do that. And often patients like threw their hands up or said like, I don't know, I don't know how to talk with you about that, or I, I don't know how to write that letter. And I, I do absolutely think there's a balance between having thoughtful conversations um, and being willing to do one's own research and you know really like do no harm. Um, but I think just in terms of immediately closing off to what someone's trying to share with you or talking with you to figure out how they can get support, I think that is where harm comes in. So you don't have to feel like you're just throwing around a gender dysphoria diagnosis. Not everyone's going to describe their experience in this way. But I felt it was important, since this seems to be such a gateway um, to how people access care, that I put it out there that it's maybe not as um, terrifying as, as we might think. I think I'm close to add time, so I'll stop it. Is this a question or a stretch? Yeah. Uh, well, I was wondering if you were going to talk about the criteria for diagnosis in children, Yeah, I'm not going to talk about the diagnosis in children. Yeah, but the WPATH um, standards of care eight have a really comprehensive section about the care for adolescents and children and non binary people as well. Um, and the main thing that they're encouraging is collaborative care, multidisciplinary care, so that you know, thinking through also um, what is that intervention that a child needs at four years old. That child needs like love, support, and affirmation. Child's not going to start on hormone therapy. A child's not going to start on blockers. They're expressing themselves differently. Maybe they're using a different name. So I think that there are lots of ways that care providers can support and families can support young people who are exploring their gender before it even wondering if it needs a diagnosis code, if it needs a medical intervention, um, like the age appropriate care for someone under 10 who's not yet at puberty isn't is non-medical care, it's social affirmation. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of things wrong with having to have DSM criteria or medical diagnoses in general to access care. So thank you for uplifting that. I don't think that this is the end all be all um, place where we're going to land. And so I know that for myself, I have to include this diagnosis if I'm talking with someone about surgery. Um, I've seen medical providers who code things as endocrine disorder um, to be able to still prescribe hormones. And maybe Dr. Goodenough might talk about that. Um, so just wanted to put that out there, but that's super important history to share as well. Any other, I think I'm close to time, yeah, hi. Um, Margaret, do you mind just going over again the, the term transgender experience and then um, what it actually means? Yeah, I, I think that that's a phrase that I hear people use for themselves. So people who are like, uh, am I trans? I don't know, um, that someone might talk about them having, sorry, there's so many clicks. Um, being of a transgender experience. And so even on some of the or organizations or institutions like intake forms, for example, I think Fenway Health and I think Whitman Walker ask someone on an intake form because that's where we're capturing sexual orientation or gender identity information, are you trans or of a trans experience? And that I think is maybe if you're not trans, you wouldn't use it, but you could think about how you're asking that question for people who are like, hesitant to claim that identity or to actualize that that is part of my identity. Um, we have patients who tell us and use this language of like, well, I'm of a transgender experience or I'm a woman of a transgender experience. Some of it may be cultural. I hear that coming from a lot of black trans women that I work with or older trans men. I'm a person of a trans experience rather than saying I'm transgender. There's, there's probably a lot of research to be done about maybe why it didn't feel safe to say I'm transgender um, for different reasons. Thanks for that. Any other questions? Absolutely. Right, I hear in that that like you're listening for your clients to tell you what they need. Um, and so if someone's like, their presentation looks different and you immediately are like, do you want the hormones? You know, we could all chuckle. That's probably not how you would handle that. Um, but you'd ask your client how they've been, you know, or like um, what they brought them in today and sort of the same things that you're taught to practice in medicine or mental health care of like seeing a person, listening, asking open-ended questions, um, letting the patient drive the conversation um, that those are all a part of gender affirming care too. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm at time. Okay. I don't think I'm uh, alone 
in thanking Britt for the wonderful presentation to start us off for today. It's always so lovely to um, hear for experts who have been doing this for such a long time. Um, just some notes on content and agenda to just responding to some of the questions we've had so far. Um, we do have printed agendas that are in a stack at the end of each of the tables at the front of the room. So um, if you all at the back are curious about the flow of the day, what sessions we have when, when we have breaks, and who our speakers are, um, we have that information printed out to you. I'm also happy we have some copies here at the front um, as well if you don't want to look in the stacks at the beginning. Um, and on that note, we do have a policy session at the end of the day. I know that there is inevitably going to be questions about gender affirming care and policy. And so we do have someone coming in to talk about kind of the state of gender affirming care legislation and policy. Uh, and notably that person, um, Paula Nira, is also one of the primary authors on the most recent WPATH guidelines. So I know there's probably some questions about what or why things were included in the new guidelines, what that means for care going forward, and we will have an opportunity to ask those questions um, towards the end of the day too. So I really encourage all to stay towards the end. Um, that's gonna be a really great session as well. Um, so if you look on the agendas, next up we'll have an hour block talking about the first half of hormone therapy um, with Dr. Elliot Goodnup. And so I'll just pass it over to you. Um, let me go get the, do you have, um, would you like me to bring up my computer for the presentation? one for now and then switch to that one in the break. I think I'll give people a couple minutes to come back.
How's the volume? Um, so, thanks for being here for this section. Um, I'm Elliot Goodenough. I'm a non-binary transmasculine person. I grew up in Tennessee, um, and I live in Philly currently. Um, I'm a primary care provider in Philadelphia. Um, I currently work for Drexel at an HIV clinic called the Partnership Comprehensive Care Practice. I also work in New Jersey at Planned Parenthood. Um, and I previously worked at FQHCs in Philly and the Bronx. My pronouns are they, them. So I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, I am going to be talking about medications used off-label. Um, in general, I'm describing gender-affirming interventions. Britt mentioned some of the folks, that, some of the things that people do for gender affirmation, cis people, trans people, non-binary people. Um, we know that gender-affirming interventions improve mental health and quality of life. The interventions that I'll be describing should be considered medically necessary um, as desired and prompted by our clients. The ones that they might access through our care include hormone therapy, surgeries, hair transplant, hair removal, contour shaping, vocal training. And this initial section focuses on um, testosterone-based hormone therapy. There's a range of interest um, across people. So the standard of care should be to provide access as desired and directed by our patients. Um, and just to start off, who's a clinician in the room? OK, you folks who aren't clinicians, um, what kind of care do you provide? Awesome. OK, who, amazing. Um, who has prescribed hormones uh, for gender affirmation for patients? OK, um, who sees trans people? Everybody, right? Great. So I know that there is experience in this room um, in addition to mine, and questions are welcome, uh, interruptions are welcome. I'd love to hear your experiences and any concerns or questions that folks have here. Um, so in terms of describing the range of interest that our patients may bring to us, um, I'm also referring here to the 2015 US Transgender Survey. Um, the largest instrument that's similar to this in the US. Um, so in this survey, about a third of the 28,000 respondents were described themselves, themselves as transmasculine, about a third as transfeminine, and about a third as non-binary. Of course, there's a lot of overlapping and expansive identities um, among the respondents. So in terms of interest in hormones, the folks who describe themselves as trans men or women, 95% um, described wanting hormones. Um, of those who describe themselves as non-binary, about half described wanting hormones. Um, and there's a number of procedures that um, the survey also asked about. Um, so for people who describe themselves as transgender men, a large majority were interested in chest surgeries, um, and you can see here, there's a range of interest in other surgeries, including hysterectomy, certain bottom surgeries. Um, the interest in that may vary based on identity. You can see on the right, um, for non-binary respondents, a different range of interest. This is a very indiv individualized question. And so we cannot predict what our patients are going to be seeking in their transition, whether someone is seeking a medical transition at all. Uh, I also want to uplift from the 2015 survey some of the specific ways that, our, that respondents described having a bad experience with a healthcare setting. Um, so this survey, uh, with some obsolete data, nonetheless asked patients, you know, in the past year, have you had any of these kinds of experiences? And 15% described having heard invasive questions that were unrelated to the reason that they came in. 24% described having to teach their provider about how to provide appropriate care. 
a small number, 8%, um, described being refused healthcare, refused transition related or general healthcare. And a fairly, fairly large minority described being verbally or physically harassed in the healthcare setting itself. So for all kinds of reasons, um, a lot of folks described not seeking medical care when they were injured or sick um, in the past year because they were afraid of being mistreated or afraid that they couldn't afford it. <clears throat> um, of course, responses also vary across intersecting identities as well. So I wanted to give a little bit of insurance history. Um, in our present context, of course, like the map here shows um, we have a lot of anti-trans bills advancing in various states. Um, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, and when our patients describe being afraid that, you know, something isn't going to be covered or that they can't afford some kind of care that they need for their gender affirmation, um, this is based in a really recent and current history. So since the 1980s, um, U.S. insurance plans routinely excluded gender, transgender care. Um, I grew up knowing that. Um, insurance plans often had a broad interpretation of what trans care was. And so with the exclusion for transgender care, that might mean any care for a transgender person. Um, and this probably contributes to a high incidence of healthcare avoidance. There has been progress um, since the 1980s on the part of the Department of Health. Um, in 2014, the Medicare exclusion for surgical procedures for gender affirmation was declared invalid. And in 2015, the Department of Health ruled that preventive services should not be denied on the basis of sex. And many insurers interpreted that in such a way as to, um, to write inclusions for gender affirming uh, interventions. Most insurance carriers have internal guidelines on trans health care, although these plans vary by employer and by state, by company. Um, some of the gains that have been made are in the courts um, from folks appealing uh, denied claims and providers similar to ourselves contributed to that effort in the courts. So of course, politics now vary geographically, insurance um, coverage varies geographically. So the general context in which we want to be seeing our patients is with a welcoming physical space. So that includes waiting rooms, inclusive bathrooms, signage, um, to announce gladly that our patients are welcome here. Appropriate clinic materials and forms, appropriate documentation. And I'll talk a little bit more about EMR issues, um, policies that are just, um, and considerate to all of our patients, engagement with patients and seeking feedback, and being familiar with local resources, um, generally sort of critical for providing care, especially to marginalized folks. Staff training, of course, is critical. Um, so Britt kind of described language concerns that come up. We need to be documenting and aware of how our patients um, name themselves, what, what pronouns our patients are using. Um, ideally have some way to record gender identity and sexual orientation data. We need to be culturally humble. Um, and like Brett said, aware that trans and gender expansiveness are not pathologic states. Um, when we do make mistakes, and we will, we can apologize briefly and move on. And let's recognize that gender identity within a patient's chart or within a patient's experience in an exam room um, should be protected health information. Um, this is confidential and it may um, exist in the room with you in a way that it exists differently um, in a different context. And with clinical care, always we want to be asking ourselves, what is my lane here? What am I doing today with this patient? Um, what is relevant to the care that I'm providing? We need to be trauma-informed and interdisciplinary. 
So the question, do I need to know, comes up depending on one's role um, in particular today. So briefly thinking about electronic health record issues, um, most health records have improved somewhat, um, often having somewhere to denote a person's chosen name and a pronoun. Um, some do not, and we have to create workarounds in them um, in order to avoid misgendering our patients um, or calling someone the wrong name. Um, we often have to bill under someone's legal name, and so we may need a separate field for that and a separate workflow for that. The gender on someone's chart may determine what kind of organ inventory that they're provided within a visit, um, what kind of screening that they're provided within a visit, and so we do have to have workarounds for that as well. Um, if a chart gender um, deviates from a person's actual physical organs or from the way that they desire to be perceived in the visit. And so a sort of two-step process is generally recommended these days for intake forms, et cetera, um, asking first, what is your gender identity, and asking what sex you were assigned at birth um, in order to appropriately uh, register someone within our EMR. Recognize also that um, gender nonconforming or non-binary folks may not really fit into these categories, even with the two-step question. Um, and we can engage with our patients to figure out creative workarounds here. So EMR you know, may provide an option to choose which organs we want to appear on in the physical exam in our notes. Uh, it may not, and we have to come up with a workaround for that for free texting. I'll talk a little bit about diagnosis later, but like Britt said, um, diagnosis may be the gateway for someone to access certain kinds of care. Um, we may or may not need to include a diagnosis that feels appropriate or inappropriate for a patient in their chart, um, but we can have that conversation with our patients um, and sometimes include more nonspecific diagnoses such as endocrine disorder, endocrine disorder NOS. Um, in order to gain access to gender-affirming interventions. So setting context for, for any visit is really establishing what a patient's goals are. And when asked the question, um, you may see a lot of different answers from folks. We can't anticipate this based on someone's appearance or previous experience. So for a transmasculine spectrum, we might hear folks who say, I'm a man, my goal is to be masculine, my goal is to have male range serum hormone levels, um, to develop a male fat distribution, um, facial hair, et cetera. Some people may say, I want this particular change in my body, I don't want that one. Um, I want a deeper voice, but I don't want facial hair. Or I'm hoping to look androgynous and kind of describe what that means to me. And so with regard to testosterone therapy, there may be room to play with dosing and frequency and um, et cetera in order to accommodate someone's goals. And this is sort of the timeline that's expected for testosterone. Um, this is borrowed from the Falks Health Library. And <clears throat> so a person may want, may be hoping that all of these changes happen for them. They may be hoping that one or two of these changes happen for them. And while there is certainly room for creativity, um, we can't always anticipate what's going to happen for each person. Um, this is often um, informed by genetics, environment, et cetera, and of course, dose, frequency, et cetera. So with regard to a lot of sort of secondary sex characteristics, we do expect changes with exogenous testosterone. Um, skin tends to become oilier and acne is very common, um, especially in the first few months to year. 
Muscle changes happen as well with increased muscle mass and strength for a lot of folks. These changes happening one year to many years. And you'll see in terms of timeline, generally it's expected to be months to multiple years before seeing a full effect. Voice pitch tends to deepen with testosterone. Body fat redistributes to a quote unquote masculine shape. Facial and body hair may grow. Periods tend to stop um, at a certain dose or um, duration of testosterone. And clitoral enlargement is common. So again, there's room to play with testosterone to accommodate certain goals within these sex characteristic changes, um, although we cannot always predict what's going to happen. The changes outlined in red here are considered to be permanent ones. We can also talk with our patients about what is reversible or not when someone stops taking testosterone. Um, things like voice changes, body hair growth, and clitoral enlargement are not expected to revert when someone stops testosterone. So for starting hormones, more and more um, providers are understanding this to be an informed consent process. Um, as we do for all other kinds of care, we want to be discussing risks, benefits, and alternatives with our patients. And that's all we need to do in order to um, initiate some kind of treatment for someone. The WPATH standards of care that Britt referred to, um, these do inform insurance guidelines often, um, and the 2022 version suggests that we provide gender-affirming medical and surgical treatment as requested with a single opinion, i.e. my opinion, when the experience of gender on incongruence is marked and sustained and other possible causes are excluded. Um, I have to stretch a little bit to think about what other possible causes are, um, but we can imagine situations where maybe someone's acute psychosis is related to gender. Um, this is quite an unusual event. Also, a person should have capacity to consent, including understanding the effects on reproduction. We, with our patients, should be first assessing physical or mental health conditions that could negatively impact the outcome of gender-affirming hormone therapy, discussing risks and benefits with our patients. And WBETH encourages us to, to um, discuss social transition together as well. So that first visit might look something like this. Um, as with anyone, we're going to ask, how can I help you? Um, we'll ask about history. If someone's interested in starting hormones with us today, have you taken hormones before? How long have you been thinking about them? What else have you done to express your gender? Are you interested in other interventions that I can help you access? And ask about goals. So what changes would you want hormones to give you? Is there anything you're concerned or nervous about from hormones? What diagnosis can we put in your chart for this? Should it be transgender person? Should it be gender dysphoria? Should it be endocrine disorder? Um, and insurance may dictate this for us, um, and we can talk with our patients about that too. Gender identity history, so how do you see yourself? When did you first become aware of your gender? Do you have community or a circle who supports you in this decision? Are you out in that circle, in your community, and the institutions that you interact with? Are you safe? We ask about medical and mental health history. So note that hormones can affect mental health. Um, often, if someone's experiencing some dysphoria and depression as a consequence, that can be expected to improve. But it's certainly not a cure-all to give someone hormones. Um, it's a complex process for a lot of people. And if someone does have a mental health experience that gets worse with hormones, we may want to adjust dosing or frequency, et cetera. So we can talk about that with folks at first. We also ask about sexual history. Are you having sex? Note that 
testosterone and estrogen-based hormone therapies are not um, adequate or complete birth control, and so we may want to use birth control separately to prevent pregnancy if someone does not desire pregnancy. Um, think about eligibility or interest in PrEP if appropriate. And note that gender-affirming hormones can affect sex drive, sexual function, and attraction. And then guidelines suggest that we ask about fertility interest before we start hormones. So it is possible that testosterone could irreversibly change someone's fertility. And if having a biological child is critical to such a person, we may want to wait until they have frozen eggs or an embryo before starting hormones. Note also that many folks have gone on testosterone, gone off testosterone, become pregnant, um, had a successful pregnancy, gone back on hormones. So these are certainly options, but we can't reliably say that someone's fertility will be um, preserved. All right, so at the initial visit here, talking about these in bold, again, medical surgical history, as with anyone, mental health history, social, family histories, any medications and all supplements that folks are taking, any allergies, and routine healthcare maintenance, gender identity history, goals and interest in hormone surgery, et cetera, psychosocial supports, what other referrals um, a person may hope to get from us today, social transition needs, um, peer support, mental health support, legal support, reproductive options, and informed consent may look like a number of different things. Some institutions do have forms for this. More and more organizations are encouraging us not to require a signed form as an informed consent for hormones. Um, just consider it an informed consent conversation like any other treatment. And if someone's going to be using injections, we can do injection teaching at that first one or two visits as well. The prescription we're talking about is testosterone, and we often are well positioned to start a prescription that first visit. And we want to be checking blood pressure, as we do for all our patients generally, and a hemoglobin or hematocrit before starting testosterone. A follow-up visit can be expected. Generally, we're seeing folks a month or three months later after a, an initial prescription. And at all these visits, we can just be asking, you know, what changes are you seeing? Um, are there things um, that have changed in your physical state, mood, sexual state, menstrual experience? Are there any problems or side effects you're experiencing? Are there any changes to your life, any changes to your goals for hormone therapy? And we may be adjusting doses as we are meeting with our patients in follow-up. Generally, a lot of protocols have us seeing our patients every three months or so for the first year, and then every six to 12 months after that if someone is on a steady dose and doing well. So again, we're just asking about changes, problems, of course, always other issues in healthcare preventive care. Um, and at those visits, we're usually checking a blood pressure, rechecking a hem hemoglobin hematocrit, and checking a testosterone level if someone wishes it. So again, the follow-up visit may look something like, how's it going, what changes, any problems, changes in your goals, how are things going in your social situation? Um, with regard to the circles or community or institutions that you're connected to. Do you want to stick with your dose or do you want to change your dose today? Do you want to check labs? Should we adjust the dose when we get the lab results back or should we adjust it now? And there's room for a lot of flexibility here depending on someone's goals for their serum level or whether they want to check their serum level at all. And when should we follow up again? A note about physical exam. Remember that an exam can be traumatic uh, for anybody. Um, our patients may be particularly sensitive to certain types of exam. We should only be examining as medically indicated. We can discuss with our patient their preferences for the exam. 
ask preferred terms for body parts, or use sort of general terms for body parts, reflect back or mirror back our patient's words to them, allow distracting tactics or a support person in the room if desired, consider allowing the patient to swab themselves for various things, STIs, HPV. Um, for a really sensitive exam, we could consider offering a benzodiazepine beforehand. And again, the exam is going to be based on the organs that somebody actually has. Um, we can't necessarily assume that we know what's inside somebody um, based on their appearance, and we can ask our patients what organs they've had. We're generally asking our patients their surgical history. We can expect to see a range of effects if someone's had experience of hormones before, or surgeries before, or other uh, gender-affirming um, behaviors. So with hormones, you might expect to see hair and muscle changes, fat changes, clitoromegaly, male pattern baldness, acne, a lot of uh, various surgeries people might have accessed in the past or interested in accessing. Um, and people may be coming to us for post-op care as well, right? So um, sometimes that there are issues with recent surgeries that we need to consider. There can also be a range of effects from chest binding or packing. Um, some people have used really restrictive materials for binding their chest in the past. There may be um, some tissue trauma from duct tape or whatever it is people have used. Sometimes there have been um, lung restriction from um, restrictive binding. In terms of labs for folks who are on testosterone-based hormone therapy, um, we just want to be more expansive with our definition of normal, as we are for everything. Um, so we may consider the male value upper limit of normal to be appropriate for our patients on testosterone for things like creatinine, hemoglobin hematocrit, ALKFOS. And this will vary by lab, of course. The actual prescription, uh, generally one of a couple of forms of testosterone, depending on patient desire, interest. So some of our patients are going to be interested in injectable testosterone. That's usually going to be t um, Enanthate is another option that's used less commonly. This can be injected intramuscular or subcutaneous, um, with a preference for subcutaneous among um, many organizations now. It can be dosed weekly or every two weeks um, for injection. And usually we're starting around 50 milligrams a week. Um, some patients are going to prefer a lower dose. Maybe we might consider 20 milligrams. Some will prefer a little higher dose to start right at what we call the quote-unquote full dose, um, up to around 100 milligrams per week, or 200 milligrams every two weeks. Some of our patients might rather use a transdermal option. Testosterone gel is available um, and in a generic form now in a 1% or 1.6% formulation. This is usually applied to the upper arm every day. And again, there's a range of dosing options. So we might start at 50 milligrams every day. We might start lower, 20 milligrams a day, and increase up to around 100 milligrams per day. There's a number of other testosterone options. Um, I'll note there's a new um, testosterone undecanoate oral option. Um, the pill that's called brand name Jatenzo. Um, this we're not seeing too often in use because it's pretty expensive, although it's being incorporated into more protocols now. Um, it doesn't have the same liver toxicity that was attributed to past oral formulations of testosterone and we'll kind of see how that goes um, in protocols. There's a patch that's the most expensive transdermal option. We don't see that used as much as the gel. Um, and there's a few other formulations, a long-acting intramuscular, um, a pellet form that's um, implanted every three to six months, a nasal gel. You won't see these as often in use as the sub-Q any questions about that? In terms of dose, um, 
really, this is just a guideline. So we may start at an initial dose, you know, that first visit. We may then change to a higher dose or a lower dose that second visit um, with room to shift around over time as the patient wishes. Um, really, the goal for the dose is whatever the patient wants for their gender. Um, but taking higher doses is not going to speed up changes and may increase risk. So we may want to be limiting to a certain maximum dose or a certain serum um, testosterone level in order to level risk, um, understanding that taking more than that isn't going to be helpful. Some patients may prefer to balance effects. So again, may want to take that sort of lower, lower dose range or even less or take it less frequently or go on and off. That's all fine. And in terms of clinical response and follow-up, um, really those questions like, how are you feeling? What changes are you noticing? Are you feeling like this is going well? Are you feeling like something needs to change today? That is the most important way to follow a patient. Um, we can be checking hormones, and some of our patients will want us to, to see how their level might relate to a, a quote-unquote typical male um, serum level of testosterone, total testosterone. So, and especially if someone's having an inadequate effect or they're concerned about a side effect, it can be useful to be checking a testosterone level. So the typical goal for someone who is seeking a full masculinizing hormone regimen would be a quote-unquote male serum testosterone of between 300 and 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. <clears throat> um, the timing of the testing is important. So if someone's on injections once a week, for example, we want to be checking mid-cycle, so maybe three days after their last dose, ideally. Um, we can also check peak and trough levels. If someone's having side effects or concerns about um, symptoms, we could check a peak level you know, a day after their injection or a trough level um, right before their next injection and kind of see what those numbers look like, if that's helpful. Again, there's no evidence that a higher serum level improves masculinization, so anything above that higher range of quote-unquote male normal um, is not going to speed up changes for anyone. And superphysiological levels may increase risks. Um, there's also a process of aromatization that can occur, so our patients may be um, interested to know that a higher dose of testosterone could actually convert to estrogen, and that could be um, not beneficial for their transition goals. And again, gender nonconforming um, patients may prefer an intermediate range, a lower range uh, serum testosterone level as their goal. There's a number of considerations that come up with testosterone. Um, so again, we may expect to see changes in someone's secondary sex characteristics. Acne is one of those that happens during a testosterone-based puberty um, for a lot of people, and we treat that like we treat acne. Uterine bleeding may be a concern for folks. Um, it's generally expected that someone on a quote-unquote full masculinizing hormone regimen will become amenorrheic by six months. Um, this can vary, so sometimes it happens one month or 13 months into the process. Um, for some patients, it doesn't happen as, they, as quickly as they would hope. So if this is a goal for someone, we could also consider using a progesterone-based birth control method to stop menses sooner. Again, we could use it as a contraceptive. For some of our patients, if menses are very distressing, we could consider a short course of an aromatase inhibitor as well for three months or less. We can also consider, of course, the form and frequency of testosterone that we're using. Is it enough? Is there hormone, is their serum testosterone level high enough um, to be at the range that we would expect to stop uh, menses? And again, if, if someone has a pre-existing or unimproved abnormal uterine bleeding history, we might consider other pathologies um, and whether someone needs an endometrial workup. Other testosterone issues, mood changes sometimes can happen. Um, 
Some people describe some irritability. We can be checking doses or serum levels if this is extreme. Um, hormones can sometimes exacerbate migraine headaches. People may experience fatigue or hot flashes. Some people experience weight gain on hormones. Um, hair loss may happen, often informed by genetics um, and someone's propensity to get um, male pattern baldness. We can consider adding finasteride or minoxidil um, as therapies if baldness is a concern for someone. And again, for anything that comes up as a concern that be, may be related to someone's total testosterone serum level, we can be checking levels and changing doses accordingly. Pelvic pain is a concern for some of our patients. Um, this is kind of being described anecdotally more and more. Um, so for folks who are on testosterone-based hormones, pelvic pain sometimes happens um, in association with their dosing cycle. Um, they may notice pelvic pain during sex or related to orgasm. It's not really clear what the cause is at this moment. Um, there are some related issues that may um, contribute. So. Vaginal tissue atrophy often does happen on testosterone. Um, it depends on the dose. Um, it does increase the risk of um, friction-based discomfort and also vaginitis and cervicitis, um, disposition to STIs, etc. <clears throat> um, pelvic pain is a common contributing reason for hysterectomy. Of course, hysterectomy may be within someone's gender-affirming goals. Um, pain may be part of their reasoning. Um, other things that come up as potential causes, if someone's had surgery, they may have adhesions or injury related to surgery. There may be some pelvic floor dysfunction. PTSD may be a reason for pelvic pain. And we can consider other etiologies as well, if this is a really distressing issue for someone. Um, consider having them write a pain diary, see how it relates to testosterone dosing or to their menstrual or putative menstrual cycle. Um, we can consider switching testosterone form. You can use vaginal estrogen. Um, this has minimal systemic absorption and may be helpful to someone who's experiencing vaginal dryness or pain. Lubrication, progestins can be helpful. Lidocaine and pelvic floor physical therapy are options as well. The last few issues that we think about with testosterone, polycythemia is probably the sort of number one risk that people um, feel concerned about with initiating testosterone. Um, usually not that big of a deal, but I'll name it here. Um, sometimes people do have above the upper limit of male normal hematocrit levels on testosterone. That may cause some symptoms of hyperviscosity, including headache, flushing, hypertension. Um, if someone does have polycythemia, it does increase their risk of cardiovascular disease and clot risk. Um, if, if you notice this on a lab result for someone and it's sort of like a singular result, consider whether maybe they were dehydrated that day. Is there another reason for this elevated level today? Smoking and sleep apnea can also contribute to polycythemia. And as with all other symptoms, we want to be thinking about testosterone form and frequency. If someone has persistent polycythemia, we may need to put them on a lower dose of testosterone or come up with some kind of creative alternative. So I've seen mentioned um, someone who doesn't really want to lower their dose of testosterone but is having higher than normal hematocrit levels, maybe they could give blood every three months. Um, and that could be a way to sort of manage the risk while maintaining their gender-affirming goals. Of course, refer to hematology um, if indicated. In terms of absolute contraindications for testosterone, um, there's a few. Um, really only if someone has an active cancer that's sex hormone sensitive, if someone has end-stage liver disease, if someone's pregnant and wants to continue their pregnancy, we're generally stopping testosterone. Um, and if someone's hematocrit is greater than 55, um, again, I would treat that one as sort of a, let's be creative around this. Um, we want to be approaching this with a harm reduction framework always. So 
when we see an issue come up on testosterone, we're addressing someone's goals with them and seeing what is the greater benefit, where is the harm, and how can we balance effects. Just a couple more slides. So the effects of gender-affirming hormone therapy, testosterone effects on cardiovascular disease and intermediate indices um, has sort of gone back and forth in literature for a long time. This is a recent um, 2022 review, and we can see that looking back at sort of past literature, um, although incomplete, for trans masculine people, there's probably an equivocal effect on cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease. Um, testosterone may increase blood pressure or it may stay the same. It probably has no effect on GLAT risk. It may increase total testosterone or total cholesterol and LDL, or they may stay the same. It probably doesn't affect insulin resistance. A brief note about surgeries. Um, there's a long list of potential gender-affirming interventions people may be interested in accessing. Some of our patients may ask us for letter support or other support or post-op support related to top surgeries such as mastectomy or breast reduction, um, bottom surgeries including phalloplasty, or metoidoplasty, scrotoplasty, which may or may not include vaginectomy, hysterectomy, et cetera. People may be looking for implants, liposuction, liperfillers. Um, and when folks are interacting with surgeons, those surgeons may be requesting letters, um, which often the primary care provider can provide for them. The state may require a consent form if they're having a sterilizing surgery. Um, some of our transmasculine patients may also be interested in vocal training. Um, there are some speech language uh, therapy protocols that relate to this, although testosterone itself does change voice, and um, most of our patients are not generally seeking voice-related surgeries, although relaxation thyroplasty has been described for um, quote-unquote masculinizing voice changes. And then screenings. We always want to think about preventive services for folks. So for People on masculinizing hormone therapy who have chest tissue, um, the recs are the same as they are for cis women with similar chest tissue. Um, there's no strong evidence that testosterone affects the risk of breast cancer. Um, for folks who have had mastectomy or other types of top surgeries, the risks are fairly unclear. Of course, it depends how much breast tissue is left. Um, we could consider doing an annual chest exam for folks, although that may not be a desire of theirs. In terms of cervical cancer, anyone with a cervix has the same recommendations. Again, um, unfortunately, testosterone can increase the risk of um, indeterminate results from a pap smear related to atrophic epithelial changes. Um, you get a lot more indeterminate results back or ask us results back. Um, and that may necessitate another pap smear, which can be quite uncomfortable for a person. So sometimes we want to do a little bit more of an aggressive swab um, with a pap smear. We can consider giving vaginal estrogen beforehand, um, maybe a couple of weeks before the exam, if someone's having significant vaginal or cervical atrophy. Um, could offer a benzodiazepine or other options to make the exam easier for someone. Maybe you could consider HPV self-swabbing. Um, some of us have protocols for that. Um, and some of our patients may not seek um, screening such as this, or may be behind in screening such as this, or may decline screening such as this. Um, in terms of bone density, there's no clear consensus on uh, DEXA screening for folks on testosterone-based therapy. Um, we might consider doing a bone density scan at age 65. Um, if someone has had ovaries removed and is not on hormones, um, especially not on hormones for an extended period, that does put them at higher risk of bone density changes and osteoporosis. We might then 
um, more emphatically suggest a DEXA scan. And I think I'm going to leave it there. Well, I'll put this case up, although I won't ask you for, um, um, for feedback on it. Um, it may be helpful just to imagine yourself seeing a patient. So in the last couple of minutes, um, I'll just read this case to you. And if you want to discuss it with a partner um, and sort of hold that thought until next time, um, that could be helpful. So let's talk about Max. Um, he's an 18-year-old trans man interested in starting testosterone and getting top surgery. He'd rather take injections um, than other options for testosterone, but he's kind of scared of the needles. And he doesn't want people at his shelter to see his hormones. <clears throat> um, his parents kicked him out when he was 16. And he wanted to access blockers before um, earlier in his life, but he couldn't because he needed their consent. He has minimal income, and he asks about insurance access and coverage. No significant medical history. So I'd ask you to think about the social um, and sort of supportive um, setting aspects of this. How do you provide a supportive visit? How do you discuss informed consent? And then what are you going to do clinically? And how, in your setting, would you navigate insurance coverage? And I'll leave that case up for a couple of minutes. Are there general questions or concerns or thoughts? Yeah, in terms of birth control for someone on um, testosterone-based therapy, you know, testosterone probably does inhibit ovulation. It cannot be considered a reliable um, inhibitor of ovulation um, at any point in the duration of therapy. And so there may be a risk of pregnancy for someone who's not having menses or hasn't for years. Um, someone who's been on testosterone for years could have an accidental pregnancy. Um, and so anyone who's having sex with sperm and is at risk for pregnancy um, may benefit from birth control. Um, any of the progesterone-only options may be helpful for such a case. Yeah, so WPATH will list um, a severe psychiatric condition um, that may affect someone's gender identity goals as a contraindication. Um, I think there's a lot of subjectivity here. And within sort of a harm reduction approach, um, I haven't ever experienced a patient who has had psychopathy that would affect their gender identity in a way that was visible to me. Um, I can maybe imagine um, a setting where a, an acute psychosis could include um, gender identity or affirmation goals that are different from someone's baseline. Um, and that's just something you would have to assess in a longitudinal relationship approach. Um, understanding that you know that's going to be informed by bias. And someone may be trans and also schizophrenic, and those two things are not related to each other usually. Line, that is, what, what is it better for, for this particular person? 
hospitals, right? Maybe that big hospital that having in, in town and then having that department and an experts like you. Uh, so that's what I, I would say, like, how, how to decide is really, what, what do you say about a situation? Mm. Yeah, well, you're right. It really depends on your setting um, and, and your personal comfort. I would say that nothing here is very hard to do. Um, so anyone providing primary care is providing primary care for trans folks um, and probably has experience with accessing insurance. Um, and so probably a lot of these questions are, are within your expertise um, or could be. Um, you know, this is really all you need in order to provide uh, gender-affirming testosterone-based hormone therapy. There's nothing else you need to know. Um, and so I do think it's helpful to know your setting. Um, is it a space that would feel safe or affirming for a trans person to come, um, for a non-binary person to come? And if not, maybe we should invite them to your setting. Um, but... We also need to decrease the threshold for understanding that we are capable of providing this care. Uh, this is easier than giving someone insulin. And there's really no limit to, uh, you know, our decision about our own comfort level um, needs to also consider the access concerns that exist within our communities. And um, if someone's coming to you asking for a certain kind of care, you probably can give it. Does that? Seem fair? I have a question. So, my clients always ask me to switch in between the gel and the injectable and the patches. Is there a conversion table somewhere? <laughs> uh, yes, conversion tables exist. Um, it, it gets sticky because it, it's always sort of an estimation, um, and you can see charts with sort of like low or medium or high, you know, or maximum dose um, suggestions for different formulations of testosterone or hormones. Um, I would say it's generally safe to sort of switch between this is considered middle dose and this one's considered middle dose, so let's try this. There's a lot of trial and error um, within that. Can you tell me more about why someone is wanting to switch? Because they heard from their friends this is better, so can they consider this now? Yeah, I guess there's no harm in changing formulation. Um, so if someone tells you, you know, every other visit, I'd rather be on the gel or I'd rather be on the injectable, it doesn't hurt to switch. Uh, it may be a headache for us um, to do that and to do the prior authorizations involved. Um, we also can counsel our patients that you know changes that are coming from hormones are going to develop over months to years, and so you may not see changes visit to visit that you were hoping for, regardless of formulation. Um, gel is usually slower acting than injectable or such as the wisdom in community. Um, so that may be part of the information that people are coming to us with. So insurance coverage for different formulations of testosterone varies. Um, and there may be some restrictions that we're not even necessarily aware of per insurance company around what they will cover or not, or what they require in your documentation. You may be able to uncover that for each company, um, or it may be difficult to decipher. Um, sometimes I fall back on like older WPATH recommendations for um, eligibility for hormones. Um, so, you know, including a gender dysphoria diagnosis and describing that diagnosis in my notes um, if the patient is um, amenable to that. Um, and then, 
you know, transdermal formulations may be harder to access within insurance than injectable formulations. Um, we can write in our notes why a patient can't tolerate injectable. Um, but you know, it requires some creativity and a little bit of like lowercase f fraud sometimes to get the patient what they need. I think I'm over time for the first talk, um, but I'll see y'all after the break. We're going to take a break until uh, 10.45, so if you could be back in your seats at 10.45, that would be great. For reference, I know this um, screen is a little bit smaller than we had hoped, so if you'd like to follow along with the PowerPoint, it's uploaded into both the app and the online portal of the conference. So if you log into your conference portal, go to this session, the PCI session, you can go ahead and download the slides and follow along if you'd like to see those tables a little bit more clearly. Um, let's give one more round of applause for our first two speakers for today. And I'll see y'all back here soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, how are you feeling about it so far? Good. Is there anything uh, you need for me? I have five and ten minute left, so if that would be helpful. But you are on track. For this presentation, so. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think, I think I can keep track of my phone probably. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks. No problem. Oh. Hi. I have a really quick question. Okay. Um, so I'm a crime reduction worker. I kind of work on my trunk, but I was doing needle exchange stuff, and this like very adorable like, T for T couple came up to me and asked if I had syringes that would work for them. Mm -hmm. My syringes work for um, estrogen, but the guy was like, oh, those syringes don't work for me. So you mm -hmm. should fast. Oh, those syringes don't work for you. Yeah. But do you have to know like, what I would provide him with? Um, it depends what he's doing with his testosterone. Is he, is he doing sub Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it depends. Um, On whether it's like subcutaneous or intramuscular? Yeah. So, I mean, sub-Q are going to be shorter, like five-eighths inches needles. I have those. And then I am are going to be like one, one and a half inches. Um, uh, but, I mean, people can also be creative with syringes, you know, like, if whatever you had probably would work for him. Um, but he may, like, have a really specific idea of what he wants to use. Okay. But if it was intramuscular, he would have wanted longer syringes. Yeah. And the gauge would be this? I'm usually giving like 23 to 25 gauge for either, um, but longer for I am. Okay. Yeah. By creative? Do you mean like, like, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to reach the muscle if you're just using a half inch needle. Sure. Um, if you're using a, if you have a longer needle, but you want to do sub Q, you could just go less far. Less far, yeah. Yeah. Are there muscles that would be more, like, uh, uh, It's hard to access muscle with a really short needle. <laughs> but the thing is that you don't really need to access muscle. So if he's someone who's open to doing a sub-Q injection or like a slant IM sub-Q injection, you could just use whatever needle he can get. So his injections would work. Like, I know from my estrogen is like something. Yeah, so I mean, it's very well established that T has great absorption subcutaneously. Okay. So if someone's doing IM, they could just not. They could just do a shallower injection. Cool. I will see if I can get some longer needles for it, but That's if not, I'll offer that next time. Yeah. Thank you. Sure.
Okay, cool. All right, let me see if I can pull up the next one. Yeah, I can come to you. Yeah, I was going to say,
I also keep hitting it. Everyone feeling ready? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll go ahead and move on to talking more about estrogen-based hormone therapy. A lot of the principles from our first um, discussion really do apply here, so we're just talking about different hormones um, prescribed, but similar um, spirit and general principles. So again, um, gender-affirming in interventions improve mental health and quality of life for everybody. Um, gender is pretty important to most people. Most of us um, feel our gender pretty deeply, um, cis folks, trans folks, non-binary folks, everyone. Um, there are some exceptions to that, of course, um, folks who do not feel gender deeply. But we should know that interventions improve mental health and quality of life should be considered medically necessary when desired. These may include hormones, surgeries, hair removal, transplant, contour shaping, voice modification, etc. And there's a range of interest among folks. Um, so the standard of care should be to provide access as desired and as directed by the patient. So referring back to that 2015 survey, um, 
here we're looking at hormone interest among trans women or non-binary folks who were assigned male at birth. Um, and most folks who identify as trans women had wanted hormones. Um, most folks who identified as um, non-binary in the survey, about half um, were interested in hormones and half were not. Um, and there's a number of procedures that are listed up here with varying interest levels. Um, you can see most trans women in the survey were interested in hair removal. Many were interested in voice therapies. Um, more than half were interested in vaginoplasty. Um, and some other procedures are listed below. Those numbers vary for folks who are non-binary identities. So when we ask about goals, um, we should be prepared to hear different things once again. Um, someone might say, I'm a woman. Um, I want to have cis female hormone levels. I want to have all the secondary sex changes that are associated with being a woman. Someone might say, I want softer skin and I want to get rid of all my hair, um, facial and body hair, but I don't want to develop breasts or I want to look androgynous, or something else along the spectrum. So again, we have room to be creative with our protocols to try to accommodate people's goals. Um, although we cannot predict what's going to happen for everybody um, with the tools that we have. So here's a timeline, again, borrowed from the Folks Health Library for expected physical changes for folks who are on estrogen uh, hormone replacement therapy. Um, usually paired with an androgen blocker. So on the scale of months to years, um, we can expect to see some skin changes, often softening of the skin, less oily skin. Muscle changes, so there may be a decrease in muscle mass, um, sometimes a decrease in strength with that, um, very much dependent on someone's physical activity. Breast tissue may grow. Body fat may redistribute, and we may see thinning or slowing of facial hair, body hair. Um, balding may slow or um, stop. Of course, there are wide variations in these effects, um, depending on doses, but also on genetics, age of starting. And we can't predictably achieve any specific configuration. Breast tissue growth is considered to be a permanent change with, um, test with uh, estrogen hormone therapy. Um, testicular volume also tends to decrease, and sperm production may decrease, and those are both considered potentially irreversible changes. So this initial visit, it's going to look pretty familiar. Um, we're asking our patients, how can I help you? What's your history of taking hormones? How long have you been thinking about them? What other things have you done to express your gender? Um, are there other things that you're interested in referrals from me for? What are your goals for hormones? What changes would you want them to give you? What diagnosis should we be using? And gender identity history. How do you see yourself? When did you first become aware of your identity? Um, do you have social supports? Is your interaction with institutions safe um, when you're considering hormone therapy? Medical and mental health histories again. Um, note that hormone therapy isn't a cure-all for depression and anxiety, although many people find it very helpful um, as their um, expression becomes more consistent with their identity. Are you having sex? Um, Androgen blockade and estrogen are not necessarily um, sure birth control, um, although they can be expected to de decrease sperm production and testicular volume. Um, people may still want to be using condoms if they're having penile sex that could cause pregnancy. PrEP may be appropriate. We can talk about our patient uh, PrEP with our patients if appropriate. And note that hormone therapy can affect sex drive, sex function, and attraction in ways that may be positive or negative for patients. Um, if someone's interested in future fertility, 
um, because of those potentially irreversible changes I described, um, it may be important to someone to freeze sperm before they start hormones. Although certainly folks may go on and off hormones um, and achieve pregnancy, um, it's not a sure thing. So first visit, medical history, so um, social history, mental health history, medication, supplements, all that sort of um, past medical history that we do for every patient. Um, gender identity history, goals and interest in hormones, surgeries, etc. Psychosocial supports, peer mental health and legal referrals as needed, reproductive option counseling, informed consent, and injection teaching if appropriate. Um, we're thinking usually about starting two medications as sort of a standard regimen for a person interested in estrogen-based hormone therapy, although there's a lot of room for creativity here um, and personalization. So as the general prescription, I'm gonna rate estrogen plus or minus an androgen blocker at the first visit. I wanna be checking a blood pressure, and if I'm planning to use spironolactone as the androgen blocker, I should be checking a blood chemistry um, that includes creatinine and potassium. And then follow up. Um, again, um, someone's coming back usually within the first three months after starting a hormone regimen. Um, and I'm asking, you know, what changes are you noticing? Physical mood, sexual changes. Are there any problems that you're having as a result of hormone therapy? Are there any changes in your life or changes to your goals for hormones? And I may be adjusting doses as we go and follow up. Usually, again, we're seeing someone maybe every three months for the first year and then every six to 12 months thereafter. Um, and following blood pressures, if someone's on spironolactone, following that blood chemistry um, and potentially checking hormone levels. So total testosterone level, and serum estradiol level as well, if someone's interested in doing those things or if that might inform your dose decisions. The follow-up visit, similarly, we're asking how's it going, changes you're noticing, any side effects, changes in your goals um, or your decisions around hormones. How are things going socially? How are things going in the institutions that you're connected to? Um, do you want to stick with your dose? Do you want to adjust your dose? Do you want to check labs? Should we ad adjust the dose before or after we get the lab results? And when should we follow up again? Here's a reminder that physical exam may be traumatic, so we should do this only as relevant. Um, allow distracting tactics, mirror people's language, Consider self-collection of swabs. Consider whether someone might benefit from a benzo before an exam. We need to base our physical exam on the organs a person actually has. And be aware of the possibility of transition effects in physical exam. So we may see breast tissue from past use of estrogen. We may see fat redistribution. Skin may be thinner. Um, we may see smaller or even retracted testicles. Someone may have had surgery in the past. Um, if we are examining a vaginoplasty, a status post-vaginoplasty patient, it's sort of a more posterior than expected, or than you might expect in a cis woman. It may benefit from using an anoscope. Um, and note that the prostate is gonna be anterior to the vaginal wall. Um, so knowledge of the um, surgical considerations and anatomy can be helpful in patients. It can be helpful to look those up. All right, you may see some effects from experiences with tucking. Um, sometimes people can develop inguinal ring hernias related to tucking. Um, there may be effects from using padding um, to alter their body contour. And some people have experience with silicone, which may refer to an a sort of range of injectable um, tissue fillers that may be injected by someone who is licensed or unlicensed um, can sometimes come with complications. Some people may have some 
necrosis or scarring or granulomas from past uh, silicone injection as, as contour fillers. In terms of labs for folks who are on uh, estrogen-based hormone therapy, um, allow yourself to be a little bit more expansive than you might with a cis woman. Um, so maybe a male value will set the upper limit of normal, um, maybe the lower limit of normal for a female value um, for creatinine, hemoglobin, and alkvas, for example. So in terms of the actual meds, um, I'm going to list a few categories here. Um, primarily, um, we're prescribing an estrogen with or without an androgen blocker. Um, Estrogen preferred um, formulations are bioidentical, 17 beta estradiol, um, and there's a few um, ways to access that. Um, estrogen does feedback inhibit testosterone production, but not fully. Um, so if someone is wanting full effect from estrogen, we usually also need to employ an androgen blocker. Um, if someone's had testes removed, of course, we don't need a blocker. Um, the most commonly used blocker in the US is spironolactone, and this, at high doses, blocks the androgen receptor and also suppresses testosterone synthesis in the testes. Um, if someone is using spironolactone alone uh, without an estrogen, um, there are some risks of menopausal symptoms, um, risk of bone loss, um, as well as hot flashes, low energy, etc. <clears throat> And as you know, spironolactone is a potassium-sparing diuretic. Um, it can affect people's blood pressure. We may need to be, take more care around someone's blood pressure regimen if they also take other antihypertensives. Um, it can cause increased urination. Um, and this is an effect that may improve with time on, on spironolactone. Um, we might need to think with our patients about dosing times um, if, the, if nocturia is a concern. Um, maybe dose it once a day in the morning or dose it in the early afternoon as opposed to at bedtime. Take some caution with spironolactone in advanced um, chronic kidney disease um, and patients who are at risk for hyperkalemia. <coughs> um, alternative androgen blockers um, sometimes used here include uh, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, finasteride and dutasteride. Um, these don't block synthesis of testosterone, but they do block conversion to DHT, um, which has a more organ-specific effect, so mostly on facial body hair. Um, we can use this um, to create some hair changes or limit the progression of baldness. Um, and it can be an option if someone maybe can't take spironolactone or doesn't want to, or is looking for a more intermediate effect. <clears throat> um, I'll give a brief note about um, GnRH agonists. So gonadotropin-releasing hormone analogs like luprolide or estrelin, um, these are more commonly used in pubertal suppression. Um, you'll occasionally see them used for adults, um, but they're pretty expensive and usually not the drug of choice um, as a blocker. Another drug class that we may consider is progesterone. Um, so in community, um, folks may hear about um, increased breast development or areolar development if you add progesterone onto your hormone regimen, changes in mood that may be positive or negative, changes in libido that may be positive or negative. <clears throat> the effect can vary, um, and it may be a short-term effect with um, progesterone effects. Um, sometimes they can have side effects, like you may have experienced with progesterone birth control methods, fatigue, depression, acne. Um, there's not a lot of data around progesterone um, in gender-affirming hormone therapy, um, which also means that there's not really evidence of harm. Um, it's fine to use progesterone um, if requested. <coughs> and then um, a brief note about CIRMS. So you won't see selective uh, estrogen receptor modulators in most protocols. Um, I'm not aware of too many folks using that, but they're a theoretical option. Um, Raloxifene 
is a selective modulator of estrogen receptor, so it's an agonist in adipose and skin um, and bone, as you may know it as a sort of osteoporosis agent. Um, it's an antagonist to estrogen in breast tissue. And so for a non-binary, gender non-conforming person interested in softer skin or sort of a more feminized body contour, but who does not want breast tissue, this could be a theoretical option um, and certainly been used anecdotally. <clears throat> There's not a lot of evidence for either efficacy or safety among trans folks for raloxifene, and it does carry a risk of um, clot and higher stroke risk, <clears throat> as does estrogen. <coughs> okay, so you may have seen dosing protocols for these meds, um, and this is sort of adapted from various protocols, UCSF, Kellen Lord, Fenway, and Planned Parenthood, um, where I'm sort of listing the most commonly used formulations up top starting with spironolactone as the androgen blocker. We're usually starting this around 50 milligrams twice a day or 100 milligrams daily. You may use a lower dose if someone wishes that. And then typically going up to around 100 milligrams twice a day on spironolactone. Most folks don't need more than that. Um, occasionally, if levels um, are intransigent, we will use higher doses of spironolactone. <coughs> And then we're pairing that usually with estradiol. So we have a pill, which can be used orally or sublingually. We have injectable estradiol, which is usually estradiol valerate. Um, this can be used intramuscular. Some protocols permit using it subcutaneously, um, and we have more evidence to support that as an option. <clears throat> and then there's an estradiol patch. So I'm giving here the sort of like initial doses that you might consider at the first visit, um, maybe titrating up to a quote unquote full dose, and then setting the maximum dose as sort of the limit of how far you'll titrate up. <clears throat> um, the patches are usually weekly or every two weeks. The weekly ones are kind of like too big or too uncomfortable for most people, um, so we'll use the smaller ones. Um, patches are also are limited to 100 milligrams, and so some people are having to use like multiple patches at once, um, which can be annoying sometimes. With the weekly injections, um, we can dose valerate weekly or every two weeks, um, as we talked about with testosterone, um, depending on someone's preferences or peak trough effects. For progesterone, there's generally two forms of oral progesterone that we'll use. Um, micronized, which is considered bioidentical progesterone, and um, medroxyprogesterone. And we'll usually dose these at nighttime because they can cause some drowsiness sometimes. Um, I'm usually not starting these in an initial regimen unless someone asks me for them, um, but certainly folks will ask. And then alternatively, I am listing a different kind of injectable estradiol called cypionate. Um, less commonly used, um, it only comes in a brand name, um, Depo Estradiol. Um, but it seems to have sort of less peak trough effects and may be helpful if um, symptoms are needing you to switch formulations. Um, there's also a gel form of estradiol that's not as commonly used as the patch. <coughs> um, Progesterone may also be used in depot form, so you could use injectable um, depot um, medroxyprogesterone. And then if we're using the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors instead of Spiro, um, finasteride and dutasteride are listed here as well. Any questions about dosing stuff?
Yeah, frequency of dosing, you know, can be adjusted per patient. Um, folks will usually describe more cyclic symptoms if they have longer dosing uh, intervals. So, you know, Q2 weeks, you may have more cyclic effects than you do with weekly dosing. You could decrease dosing or decrease frequency more or interval more, maybe take it every five days, um, depending on someone's, you know, the side effects that they're experiencing and how distressed they are and what they want to do. Does that answer your question? So the app here asks, why can I do it every other day? What is the kind of... <laughs> yeah. I, well, there, there is a risk of overdosing, right? Like, um, you can certainly develop super physiologic uh, estradiol serum levels, which is not going to um, improve symptoms and isn't going to improve effect, but may increase risk. Um, so, you know, we may have patients asking us for more or for more than one formulation of estrogen um, in the hope that it will quicken their feminizing process or decrease symptoms of sort of cyclical symptoms. Um, it, there is some counseling required here. You know, using an estrogen injection every other day is possible. You'd have to do a pretty low dose um, to keep yourself under the maximum um, and to keep yourself from breaking through that super physiologic serum level. So there's room for creativity there, but I probably would advise against uh, doing an injection every other day. Um, and know that, you know, pills and gel, or pills and patches work just as well. Um, there's some belief in community that um, injectable may be faster or more effective. And that, of course, is something we should listen to. Um, but we have a lot of evidence that pills work just as well. Any other sort of dose or formulation concerns? All right, so dose, like we said, is informed by patient goals, you know, whatever the patient wants to do. Um, there may be some logistic constraints like we've talked about um, with prescribing and pharmacy and prior authorization, um, insurance restrictions. Um, but usually we can be flexible and accommodate our patients' desires and counsel um, our patients about expected effects and timeline. Um, know that taking higher doses or taking you know, multiple formulations of estradiol is not going to speed up changes and can increase risk. Um, some of our patients may want lower um, or sort of intermediate effects um, or specific effects. So perhaps someone does not want to be on an uh, androgen blocker because they want to retain erectile function for sex or pleasure or for work. Um, and that's fine. You can use uh, estrogen without a blocker. Or someone may want to sort of limit feminization, um, have a more sort of intermediate effect and select which meds and which doses um, accordingly. <clears throat> There's a lot of room for creativity here. Um, and as long as we're not exceeding sort of maximum doses or serum levels, all of that is fine. Um, in terms of response, again, we're really following clinical response, how someone is feeling about the changes that are happening, um, side effects that they're experiencing. We can be monitoring hormone levels as well, um, especially if someone um, is having a concerning effect or feels like they're having inadequate progress. <clears throat> it can be helpful or reassuring to check levels. Um, where the target for sort of a typical feminizing regimen, a female range serum estradiol level, is going to be between 100 and 200 um, picograms per milliliter and a serum testosterone goal of less than 55 nanograms per deciliter. Um, ideally, we're checking this mid-injection cycle um, or six hours after the last oral dose. Um, we can also check peak trough levels. So if someone is having symptoms that are cyclic, um, you know, right after they use their injection, we could check a level then um, and see you know, how high is it. We could check a trough level right before their next injection. 
and see if maybe we can alter frequency or dosing in order to stabilize those levels a little bit. Um, it may take longer or be harder to achieve this testosterone suppression um, than to get the estradi uh, estradiol serum level to goal. Um, it sometimes requires some patience. Um, and like we said before, you know, having a higher estrogen level um, than the sort of cis female target range um, is not going to improve feminization or make it happen faster. It can increase risk. So some considerations of estrogen and androgen blockers. Um, often we'll see a loss of erectile function. This may be desirable or undesirable depending on the person. Um, if someone is wishing to be on an androgen blocker um, but to keep erections, you can try sildenafil. Um, sometimes that can be helpful or consider reducing or stopping androgen blockade. Uh, low sex drive is also pretty common. It's not super clear how this is related to testosterone levels. Um, we can consider uh, checking someone's serum testosterone level to see how that relates to sex drive, if that's an important issue for someone. If someone has had testes removed, sometimes it's helpful to give back a little bit of testosterone um, for erectile fun uh, function or libido. Genital pain is also an issue that comes up more and more anecdotally. Um, this can occur for folks um, on estrogen-based hormone therapy. Um, it may be related to genital atrophy um, or just the decreased frequency of erections. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to have more erections if that's something that is um, acceptable to a person. And genital pain tends to resolve after a few months. Um, some other hormone-related effects may include headaches, exacerbated migraines, fatigue, brain fog, hot flashes, weight changes, um, and mood changes can happen as well, um, sometimes related to insufficient or, um, not, or serum levels not at goal. It can be helpful to check serum levels um, to evaluate these things. Some of the more sort of serious concerns um, include galactorrhea. Galactorrhea is also, uh, you know, reasonably common. Um, it's usually minimal and usually self-limited on estrogen. There have been some case reports of people developing prolactinomas. Um, this is by no means a common phenomenon, um, and usually even when it does happen, they're just managed expectantly. Um, if someone does have excessive galactorrhea, as well as symptoms of a um, prolactinoma, visual disturbances or headaches, we should be checking a prolactin level. Um, we do not need to check prolactin levels on everybody. And then the risk of clot is probably the main concern for most providers who are prescribing estrogen. Um, there's sort of mixed data on this with regard to oral estradiol. Um, there does not appear to be an increased risk of clot with transdermal estrogen, um, so estrogen patches or gel are preferred in patients who are deemed high risk for a PE, DVT, or, or stroke. Um, of course, the risk of a clot is higher with smoking. In terms of estradiol contraindications, um, again, pretty limited. So if someone does have a history of an estrogen-sensitive cancer, we should be very careful about uh, restarting estrogen. If we are treating an active venous thromboembolism, um, generally we're stopping estrogen for the duration of acute treatment, and then restarting preferably with transdermal estrogen. And if someone has end-stage liver disease, um, it's also considered a contraindication. <clears throat> as for spironolactone, as we said, there's a risk of hyperkalemia, um, if someone does have baseline hyperkalemia, we want to be a little more cautious. Um, if someone has a potassium consistently higher than six, we may consider stopping to st um, stopping spironolactone. Um, advanced chronic kidney disease with GFR less than 30 um, would be considered high risk for spironolactone and Addison's disease as well. 
But as we said, um, always we're approaching with a harm reduction framework here. The harm of stopping someone's hormones may be higher than the risk of any of these um, medical concerns. So always we need to be talking about risks, benefits, and informed consent with our patients. Um, I pulled this, I tried to find a recent review on the prevalence of um, thrombotic risk in people who are on estrogen therapy, <coughs> or tra uh, trans women on estrogen therapy. And this one shows a high heterogeneity across subgroups, so um, difficult to generalize. But for trans women on estrogen in this review, they saw a VTE incidence of about 2.3 per 1,000 person years. <clears throat> um, this can be compared to 3.5 for cis women on combined oral contraceptives, which is generally like an accepted risk level, right? So um, just to give a little context here about actual risk, and note that incidence is probably lower depending on estrogen formulation or frequency or uh, duration. And then heart disease, um, cardiovascular and disease. Um, again, literature has kind of gone back and forth on um, level of risk for um, estrogen um, affirming hormone therapy. The risk of Cardiovascular disease may be higher with estrogen-based hormone uh, therapy. Stroke risk may increase. Clot risk may increase. Um, looks like cholesterol generally goes down with estrogen-based hormone therapy, and there appears to be no effect on insulin resistance. All right. Um, a brief discussion about surgeries. Um, again, our patients may have had these surgeries, which may affect um, their presentation on physical exam. Um, patients may be asking us to participate in their post-op care or give referral letters for someone to access surgeries, and we can help in all these ways. So surgery may include um, breast augmentation, vaginoplasty, orchiectomy to remove testes. You can do this with or without um, with or without removal of a penis, facial procedures, um, feminization procedures, tracheal shave and vocal surgeries. There's various um, there's various surgeries that can be done for vocal change. People may be interested in implants or liposuction or lipofillers. And when we're interacting with surgeons, they may be requesting letters. Um, as we heard about this morning, sometimes more than one letter, although the new WPATH guidelines really do suggest that people not be asked to bring more than one letter to a surgeon. Um, and the state that you're in may require a sterilization consent form if someone is having um, testes removed. <clears throat> Vocal training is also um, an option that can come from various practitioners, and we may, we may be able to help refer patients to that. And electrolysis is another um, intervention that patients may ask us to help them find. In terms of screenings, limited uh, information about this. So breast cancer um, screening, not really clear. Um, we, we can consider screening trans women um, as we do with cis women if they have had more than five years of hormone use and have breast tissue um, that could undergo mammogram. Um, trans women likely have lower risk than cis women depending on duration of hormone exposure and breast tissue. And then for bone density, not a lot of consensus here either. Um, we may consider DEXA screening at age 65 um, or if someone does have risk factors or a history of removal of testes without taking supplemental hormones, um, we would consider them at a higher risk for osteoporosis and recommend screening. Um, my talk has really been focused on gender-affirming care for adults. Um, I did want to give a little talk about children and adolescents. I'm um, not going to give a lot of detail here. Um, note that, you know, we're usually initiating these particular hormones 
for folks who are around 16 and older. Um, folks may experience puberty blockade before that age um, or may not. Um, of course, we know that children are aware of their own gender, as we heard, by age four, sometimes earlier. Um, support for uh, kids' asserted gender definitely improves their mental health scores. And youth who reach adolescence um, feeling incongruence about their gender are unlikely to revert to um, identifying with their assigned sex at birth. Um, we should feel confident about being able to offer gender-affirming treatments to these adolescents. Um, a lot of us in our settings may not be well-equipped to offer blockade. There may be um, pediatric endocrinologists who are better equipped within our systems, although this is certainly a care that we can offer um, within, within a lot of our clinics. Um, usually we're describing GNRH analogs as the sort of pu puberty blockade and or gender affirming hormones depending on um, stage of development. <clears throat> and we know that these improve quality of life in trans adolescents. Um, the GNRH agonists, you know, luperlide and histrelin are injections or implants that were usually starting at the beginning of puberty. Um, so you start around 10 or stage 2, and you would be monitoring serum hormone levels, ultra-sensitive LH and FSH as well. We know that you know, a goal of puberty blockade is to prevent unwanted permanent changes that may allow us to avoid future surgeries or procedures. Um, we should consider puberty, puberty blockade to be reversible and safe. Um, of course, it can limit future fertility, um, but there have been some cases of ovarian retrieval post blockers that have been successful. And we can also consider you know, progesterone to prevent menstruation um, if a patient is interested in testosterone but hasn't yet um, started hormones. All right. Um, a lot of our states require that we have guardian consent for um, patients under 18. And we may be in a role to help parents understand how important and medically necessary these interventions are um, for kids. And then I kind of want to go through just a list of references. Um, this is where I'm ending, but this is really all you need to know in order to say yes to a patient requesting hormones. Um, you, you are certainly now capable of um, prescribing hormones. Um, it can be helpful to look to these references if you want to look up dosing charts, et cetera. Um, but you know, this is a really easy kind of care to give. Most of us are doing more complex care than this in our settings um, and are able to start offering this. I was talking in the back a little bit about um, people's reservations about starting to offer hormone therapy to patients who ask for it and you know, thinking that maybe someone else in their state or region is doing it. And often there's kind of not. Um, you know, the centers where people expect to be able to access hormones may have long wait lists, um, or there's really not providers um, as many as you would hope. And really, any access is better than no access. And so, you know, your setting may not be perfect, but it may still be better and reducing harm for you to say yes to patients who are asking you for this service. So the UCSF guidelines, I referenced those heavily um, in this talk. They have a Center of Excellence for Transgender Health, which is really helpful. Their guidelines are available online. Largely haven't really been updated since 2016, but are still very helpful. Um, Fenway also has um, a couple of um, helpful websites, which include sort of training um, webinars, et cetera. Um, they have this injection guide that can be helpful for giving to patients. Transline, as Brett mentioned earlier, um, you can you know, email a question to the service and they'll get back to you within a couple of days if you have a complex case. They do have these um, guidelines as well that have doses that can be accessible from just like a couple of pages, um, which is helpful. 
Cal and Lord um, has a couple good references on their website too. They have guidelines for patients on like safer binding and safer tucking, which I've found helpful. Um, the WPATH guidelines you can also find online at the WPATH.org website that give the most recent standards of care, um, sort of understood as the international standard, and that often inform insurance policy. And then the trans survey report that I referred to earlier, um, the last available report is from 2015, but the 2022 one should be up shortly, and we'll see some data from that. All right, so I know we have some time for questions and, and or a case uh, discussion. Um, are there any questions um, about estrogen-based hormone therapy? Any comments? Yeah. Yeah, so low libido is a common and fairly expected side effect of androgen blockade. Um, I was referring to supplemental testosterone in a patient who's had an orchiectomy. So if someone has had testes removed, um, they're not gonna be on an androgen blocker, and they may have very low testosterone levels that may affect their sex drive. We could consider um, adding a little bit of testosterone for those patients, as we do for cis women. This patient would be on, or would likely be on estrogen. So if someone's had testes removed, they wouldn't need androgen blockade. They may still wish to have estrogen um, as a sort of feminizing hormone regimen. Um, they may still wish to have progesterone, and they may wish to take a little bit of testosterone as well. Yeah, do you know reports of people doing that who are on blockers? Yeah, that's a great idea. So someone who's on spironolactone or another androgen blocker potentially could use testosterone gel for genital use. Yeah, so th the most commonly used injectable estrogen is estrogen valerate. Um, that's usually what I prescribe. I have had folks ask me specifically for cypionate, which is also fine. Um, know that cypionate is only available as a brand name, um, the five milligram per milliliter uh, depo estradiol. May be harder to access with insurance or whatever, um, but you could probably make an argument for it in someone who prefers. Um, there, it's been reported that there's sort of less of a peak effect with cypionate, and so someone who's having significant side effects right after their injected dose um, may want to switch to cypionate. Um, it may have effects on sort of the pace of feminization for that reason also, but it should be um, effective and may come with less side effects. Does that answer your question? So there's a question about um, folks who are on long-acting antipsychotic medications um, and the risk of prolactin elevation 
from both the antipsychotic and the estrogen. Um, I don't have experience with that uh, personally. I do think you sort of pose it as a question about like, might you expect resistance from the patient psychiatrist with regard to prescribing them hormones? Um, and I think that I would address that in sort of a harm reduction manner as we do for a lot of things. Um, knowing that someone's mental health status may very much depend on their experience of gender affirmation and that we can follow prolactin levels if it's indicated. Um, and so if it's just a question of sort of convincing the psychiatrist that it's okay, um, I'd push pretty hard to say, you know, I feel confident that we can do this. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so if someone has interruption in their hormone therapy, um, there's no reason to start over with a, like an initial or low dose. Um, if someone knows what dose they've been on, what dose they want to be on, that is fine. Restart where they were. Is, is it two years, three years later? Yep. Yeah, and it's very, you know, some of our patients may want to start higher than the quote unquote initial dose. That's also okay. Um, knowing that we may need to moderate later um, if their serum levels are super therapeutic. Was there? So Callan Lord has a great guide. You may be able to answer this better. A great guide on safer tucking and safer binding. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some tissue trauma from tight binding and tight tucking. Um, you know, people may have abrasions or may have um, bruising from doing like really tight um, interventions like that. Um, I've never seen a hernia, although you can sometimes expect, like if you pull your testes back into your body frequently, you may expect to develop some herniation at the inguinal ring. Um, but, it, you know, it, it can be hard sometimes for our patients to access sort of safer supplies for doing these things. Um, and we may be able to access um, some funding for our patients or um, you know, find them a sort of like a donation option for like tucking panties or binders um, that may be considered safer than using tape or whatever. Um, so the question's about, you know, perceived safety of whether you should keep a binder on overnight. Um, you know, lower duration of binding is probably considered safer. Um, if someone feels comfortable taking off their binder to sleep, I would generally advise that. Um, some of our patients won't, and, and we'll kind of deal with that as it comes. Um, also, a lot of a lot of us have experience with binding for years and years and years, and we're fine. Um, so I think like referring patients to those guides is really helpful. Um, using it as a reference point and understanding that everyone has sort of a different experience of um, their relationship to that part of their body.
Mm. Yeah, a, a little asterisk on surgery as well. Um, the WPATH guidelines and a lot of surgeons will um, often desire that a patient has been on hormones for a certain amount of time before accessing certain surgeries. Um, and that may relate to expectations for the surgical effect. So, you know, being on estrogen for six months or more in order to develop, develop some breast tissue may be helpful for augmentation mastoplasty. Um, and having some um, atrophy of testes may be helpful before having bottom surgery. So, um, with some room for um, holding patients' goals as supreme, um, I would say those sort of surgical recommendations um, can be expected and sometimes can be helpful in terms of hormones and in, in advance. Um, so similarly, I'm going to put up this case just to think about how you would approach a patient. Um, you may have seen a patient like this. So maybe in the last 15 minutes, if you want to talk to a partner um, in the room about this case, and then we can sort of think through questions briefly. Um, so Marta is a 68-year-old trans woman who wants to start injectable estradiol and micronized progesterone, as well as dutasteride for balding. She wants to get an orchiectomy and doesn't want to start spironolactone before that. She heard that it's terrible. Um, she does not prefer estrogen patches because she has sensitive skin and she's heard from other trans women that they fall off. And she doesn't want pills because of her cardiac history. She does want to check her estrogen and T levels every month because she's curious. And she hasn't talked to anyone about her decision to stop, start hormones. Um, maybe she delayed this long because of a job or a person she was waiting to fall out of her life or whatever. Um, her past medical history is significant for hypertension, high cholesterol, a history of two heart attacks with two stents, depression with suicidality in the past due to her gender dysphoria. She's not ready to quit smoking until her mental health improves, which she expects to happen with hormones. So I would ask you, on seeing this patient, do you have any immediate reactions or concerns about her plan? How would you approach informed consent, um, knowing her mental health and other health history? How would you approach a risk-benefit discussion about clot risk and cardiovascular risk? Um, might this be similar to a risk-benefit discussion about contraceptives? And how would you think about her plan for lab testing? So I'll give you guys like a few minutes to ruminate on that, um, maybe talk to a neighbor, mm -hmm. and we can do like a brief um, call back after that 10 minutes.